it happened while I was hiking alone in Yellowstone National Park. My name is Weira Nijoni, and I work as a ranger in this beautiful place. On that day, I decided to tread a less traveled path, deep into the woods. The walk was serene, the chirping of birds echoed through the dense trees. As I made my way through the foliage, I stumbled upon an old, abandoned Native American reservation. Intrigued by the mystery, my curiosity led me further. I continued through the deserted site, finding all kinds of relics from long ago. Lining the edges of one particular longhouse were intricately carved wooden figures, about a dozen in total, each wielding different weapons or defensive items. Suddenly, there was a rustling sound nearby. I called out to see if there was another hiker nearby, but received no reply. I decided it must have been an animal startled by my intrusion on its home. Following this eerie incident, I decided to set up camp for the night near a natural spring hidden behind tall willow trees. I unfolded my sleeping bag and gathered some sticks for the fire pit. As night fell, silence descended upon the reservation. In the disconcerting calmness, I heard unmistakable footsteps emerging from nearby bushes. Startled, I initially reached for my cell phone before realizing there wouldn't be any signal this far into the park. Adrenaline coursing through me, I cautiously glanced around and saw a looming figure, part human and part beast. Though unable to comprehend what stood before me, head adorned with wild antlers yet unmistakably predatory eyes staring at me intently, I subtly reached for my hiking stick which had a small knife mounted at its end and stayed quiet as I observed this astonishing creature. As it approached nearer, sniffing around my campsite for clues about my identity or intentions, I noticed how it bore many scars and could be the collective totem of a long-ended tale. I stayed motionless, entertaining the strangest notion that somehow it was an amalgamation of spirits left to haunt this neglected settlement. Spare change? I uttered, hoping to diffuse the tension with humor. The creature awkwardly paused, cocking its head to the side as though judging my tone. Having no weapon more significant than a small knife on hand and being far from any help, I decided to begin recounting tales from my childhood, praying that if the creature were indeed a native spirit, it would find some connection or comfort in the stories of my past before my eyes. Inching closer with every phantom word unspooled into the dark thread of history, it seemed to listen as it picked its way through shadows around my dismantled camp, threatening further at every whispered recollection. As my voice carried through the air, telling stories ranging from family anecdotes and tribal traditions passed down through generations, the creature continued stalking its way around me. Its breaths came out in guttural snarls as it circled. Every passing moment seemed to intensify our exchange further. With fleeting thoughts about people back home or being reported missing by hikers and park rangers coming upon this now violated sanctuary, panic continued to twist and turn inside me more viciously than anything outside could muster. As I continued recounting tales from my childhood, the creature's interest seemed to grow. At times, it would stop circling me and stare intensely as if trying to assess something beneath the surface of my stories. Realizing that this could be my only chance at staying alive, I dove into more personal stories, the daily struggles of life and the lessons learned from my elders. Then, without warning, the creature lunged at me. I instinctively put my arms up in defense and it seemed to take note of this action, pausing for a moment before resuming its circling once again. The brief moment of reprieve vanished as quickly as it had arrived. What do you want? I finally stammered out, my voice trembling with fear. The creature responded only with a guttural snarl and continued its menacing movements around me. I frantically glanced around the desolate campsite for any form of help or salvation, but found none. As much as I wanted to call out for help, I knew that doing so could potentially jeopardize my situation further. Moreover, 
There was no guarantee that anyone would hear my frantic pleas in such a remote location. The creature continued stalking me, its dark eyes locked on mine, as if deciding what to do next. It was then that I noticed a noticeable limp in one of its hind legs. Perhaps this was a weakness that could be exploited. How did you end up like this? I asked quietly, hoping that opening dialogue might give me an opening for escape or at least buy me some time. To my surprise, the creature responded by leaning in closer towards me, its foul breath hot against my face. As we stood inches apart, our eyes met and locked onto one another. Surprisingly, instead of snarling or making any attempts to harm me, the creature seemed almost remorseful for its current state. Its scars were glaringly apparent, carved into its tough hide as if marking a harrowing past. The creature's demeanor softened ever so slightly, and I took this opportunity to make my escape. Swiftly, I edged backward towards my campfire, using the warmth to create a barrier between the creature and myself. As I did so, it remained motionless, only studying my actions with a hesitant gaze. Once I was safely behind the fire, I reached down to grab my backpack quickly and began retreating slowly towards the edge of the campsite. The creature made no effort to follow me. Instead, it simply sat and watched as I made my departure. As I sprinted away from the forsaken place, tears welled up in my eyes as a wave of relief washed over me, having escaped certain death by the narrowest of margins. My heartbeat pounded in my ears, echoing through the darkness that concealed both me and the mysterious creature. Arriving back at civilization felt like returning from another world, one filled with terror and mystery that left me forever changed. Though no one knew of what transpired during that fateful encounter, memories of those guttural snarls and piercing eyes still haunted my dreams for years to come. I never mentioned the incident to anyone, fearing they would think me mad or a liar. Instead, the creature remained an enigma, dangerously beautiful yet terrifying all at once. Years later, stories emerged of similar incidents by hikers in remote regions who claimed encounters with a cryptid, a fabled beast from unknown origins. Its features matched what I had seen that night, enough to make me shiver at the undeniable truth. Deep within remote places on Earth, there exists both beauty and horror. For in those dark corners of our world reside creatures that defy imagination holding the power to both sustain life through age-old stories or bring utter destruction through ruthless attacks. That day remains etched in my mind, a chilling reminder of the fragile balance between life and death. The creature's intentions may forever remain a mystery, but one thing is for certain. Regardless of the beast it had turned into, there was once a time when it too was a part of someone's story. This happened to me a couple of summers ago, before we moved away from Stony Hollow, a small town nested in the Appalachian Mountains. My name is Cullen Keaton, and although I'm an office worker now, I used to be quite the hiker. At the time, my best friend Keynes and I were planning an outdoor adventure. An unexpected call interrupted us. It was Luca Menden, who had been searching for his cousin, Nolan Pickford. Nolan vanished into the mountains a week prior. It struck us as odd that someone would venture so deep into those shady woods. Luca needed our assistance. He gathered a group including Keynes and me, along with Weldon Velasco and Elda Stillsbury. Elda specialized in tracking and wilderness survival, while Weldon was skilled with firearms. United by our common concern for Nolan's safety, we embarked on an arduous search. As we penetrated deeper into the woods, we became increasingly skeptical of Nolan's decision to wander off on his own. Scattered remnants of abandoned camps lay around us as tangible reminders of past tragedies. As the air grew heavier with each step further into this forbidding territory, we decided to stop for the night. Huddled around our makeshift campfire, Elda told us about her childhood, 
growing up just beyond these ominous hills. She recalled stories showing how people had come to this place seeking solace, only to endure horrors beyond description. When dawn finally arrived after a sleepless night listening to guttural whispers in the wind, we stumbled upon something truly gruesome. Lifeless eyes stared back at us from Nolan's severed head impaled on a jagged tree branch. Weeping over our fallen friend while panicked with disgust, we realized that others were stalking deep within these bewitched forests, mountain men with devious intentions and cannibalistic desires. Fear gripped our hearts as we pondered the fate of the countless lost souls who traversed before us. We knew we must alert the authorities, but our phones had no signal. Left in a desperate situation, with no other viable options, we elected to persevere, determined to uncover the truth behind these odd occurrences. Trudging through the forest, we skirted razor-sharp rocks and steep ravines where any injudicious step could lead to certain doom. Suddenly, Weldon interrupted our thoughts. His gruff voice shook as he whispered, Get down. We pressed ourselves against the ground and watched as figures emerged from the thick foliage. The men had disheveled hair and wore tattered clothing that displayed layers of caked dirt. Their robust bodies bore countless scars gathered from vicious encounters. From their belts hung an assortment of rusty knives and other cruel instruments. Our group remained hidden behind an outcropping while Weldon aimed his rifle toward the approaching menace. A tense moment passed as we waited with bated breath. When they seemed close enough, Weldon took a shot. One of them crumpled to the ground, and chaos erupted. Swarming around their fallen companion like rabid animals, these deviants tore at his flesh, greedily consuming it, even as blood pooled around their knees. Repulsed by this sickening scene, Luca suddenly burst into hysterical laughter before succumbing to tears. As distressing emotions surged among us, Keynes leaned over to me and nervously whispered, Cullen, what if they knew Nolan? Are they... friends? I shook my head solemnly in response. Understanding dawned upon us that these deviants were ultimately responsible for his demise. Knowing that these cannibals were the cause of Nolan's death, we realized we had to escape and call for help. We couldn't rely on our phones, which lost reception in this remote area. Additionally, the fact that we were alone and outnumbered by these ruthless beings made it all the more difficult to confront them. The cannibals continued consuming their fallen companion, leaving us with a small window of opportunity to sneak away. We scoped out the area and found an old dirt path that seemed to lead down the mountain. We crept silently through the foliage, trying not to alert our enemies. On occasion they'd look up from their grisly feast and scan their surroundings, presumably searching for intruders like us. As we traveled deeper into the forest, it became clear that these mountain men had been prowling this territory for some time. Guttural growls echoed through the trees as we spotted crude traps strewn across our path, dangerous mechanisms designed to ensnare unsuspecting animals or humans. Soon enough, Fatigue began to take its toll on our group, along with mental exhaustion from witnessing such horrors. We desperately needed some form of shelter or a safe haven, where we could regain our strength and perhaps find a means of contacting authorities. The faint sound of running water caught our attention. We followed it in hopes of finding either a fresh water source or even a ranger's station. As we approached a fast-flowing river, there stood a decrepit wooden cabin nearby. Entering cautiously, we inspected the surrounding area for signs of recent human activity or any indication that cannibals frequented this place. The cabin appeared abandoned, allowing us to briefly rest without fear of imminent danger. We knew there was no time to linger. Those cannibals would eventually notice our escape. Determined not only to save ourselves, but also prevent more innocent lives from falling victim to these madmen, we brainstormed our next move. I recalled passing a sign for a ranger's station only a few miles before our initial encounter with the mountain men. If we mustered enough energy to travel that distance, help would be within reach. We forged ahead, 
driven by the desire to escape the clutches of this remote mountain and those who inhabited it. Our progress was hindered by cryptic markings etched onto trees, symbols made by the cannibals to communicate with each other. We feared they might be tracking us, but vowed not to let fear dictate our actions. Tired and dehydrated, but motivated to prevail, we finally arrived at the ranger's station. Its modest size belied its capacity to save us. We frantically knocked on the door, not knowing what we'd find on the other side. A park ranger greeted us warily, quickly gauging our disheveled state. We explained our encounter with the cannibals and pleaded for help. The ranger listened somberly as he offered assistance, providing first aid and contacting local law enforcement on our behalf. Soon enough, authorities swarmed the area in search of these mountain men responsible for Nolan's death and unspeakable acts committed against countless others. It never occurred to us that such horror could unfold so close to civilization, but now we knew otherwise. While we mourned Nolan and struggled to process the ordeal we had survived, Justice was sought on his behalf, and for every other unfortunate soul who crossed paths with those cannibals. The world would never be the same after witnessing such atrocities perpetrated by fellow humans in this remote corner of civilization. But for every dark deed uncovered in this world, such as those committed by these depraved individuals, there also arise stories of resilience and unity among strangers as compelling as ours. Though we had lost a friend in Nolan, his memory fueled our determination to ensure that no one else falls victim to the horrors of this mountain. The silence of the Wyoming wilderness was sacred to me, a lone fire lookout named Penn stationed at the Huckleberry Fire Tower. Summers here were tranquil, though sometimes the isolation wore thin on my patience. Thirteen weeks in, with only the radio and an ever-present expanse of green for company, life could become mundane. Then came the broken twigs, a pattern of steps too heavy, too deliberate to be any local wildlife I knew. It began as a distant curiosity, but soon these signs marked a calculated trail leading far too close to my tower. I'd learned in my solitary service that nature lived by unwritten but inviolable laws. What moved out there now seemed uninhibited by such rules. The shift from curiosity to concern was punctuated by a discovery that Summer's Thursday wouldn't let me forget. During a routine perimeter check, the underbrush revealed what only could be called an altar. Mounds of earth adorned with the remains of deer, all arranged in methodical chaos. No predator I knew took trophies or paid homage. Fear is a weighty thing when you're miles from anyone who might hear you scream. Chet, the off-season ranger, was quick on the radio when I called in my findings. Gruff voice crackling through static, he dismissed it as poachers with peculiar habits. But Chet didn't see the precision in those placements. Didn't smell the iron tang hanging thick like fog among the trees. I'll come up and take a look tomorrow, was his final word on it, before signing off with his usual unnecessary joke about how being scared of Bambi seemed unbecoming of a fire lookout named Penn. The night did nothing to ease tensions. There are sounds one expects alone in the woods, nocturnal creatures making known their existence. Yet this was different. Rhythmic scratches against wood echoed up to my lofty sanctuary. Labored breathing heavy enough that each exhale seemed a whisper against my tower's windows. The creature, because surely this was no man, was always just out of sight, yet felt oppressively close. Its presence was invasive and intimate, an intruder one can feel but not fend off. My name may have been Penn, but I wrote no letters home composed no wills or goodbyes when dawn bled through night's shroud and I saw it, the creature, clearly for the first time at woodland's edge. Large beyond bear size yet hunched unnaturally and covered in matted fur, or maybe clothing, it watched me under quivering hands that almost mimicked prayer. When Chet finally arrived later that day, his jocular demeanor faltered upon witnessing whatever it left behind, 
just where dirt met timber. Heavy footprints surrounding my tower, deep enough to suggest both heft and, perhaps, intent. We ventured together back to yesterday's grotesque shrine, only to find further manifestations, more displays featuring flora interwoven with fauna bones, now fresher than before and unsettlingly humanoid in structure. With weapons useless against an entity so foreign to our knowledge, we decided escape would be prudent until proper authorities could investigate. But retreat proved challenging as every trail appeared compromised with signs that this creature didn't simply roam. It understood strategy, a terrifying implication. Eyes taut with unshared panic, we planned our cautious extrication from Huckleberry Tower under watchful pines weighed down by more than snow prelude. Chet and I made it down the tower. We kept silent, our steps careful. The forest surrounded us, dense and alive with threat. We had no signal here, no way to call for help. Isolation was our enemy as much as the creature was. Should we split up? Chet whispered. No, I replied. It's what it wants. We marched hour upon hour, hunger clawed at our bellies, fear at our resolve. Then a crash echoed through the trees behind us. Twigs snapped, leaves rustled. Run! I shouted. We surged forward, hearts pounding, the creature's growls reverberating after us. Sweat soaked my shirt as we reached a clearing. An old truck sat there, abandoned but hopeful. We scrambled inside and were soon careening down the path, the engine roaring defiance at our pursuer. Days passed before help arrived. Local authorities, armed and cautious. They found no creature but reported our find. Five bodies deep in the woods near Huckleberry Tower, torn apart, unrecognizable as if defiled by anger or hunger or both. A journal lay among them, pages filled with sightings of a large figure stalking these woods for years, its behavior more cunning than any known animal. Now here I sit at home, safe but not at peace, knowing something walks those trees, a creature unknown but undeniably real and lethal. And tonight, even back in civilization's embrace, I hear a faint rustling outside my window reminiscent of those fearful nights escaping an almost certain fate. Yet this is only the wind, isn't it? This happened to me a few years back. Reckoning it up now, it feels even more surreal, like a half-remembered fever dream. I'm Kyson, not exactly what you'd call the outdoorsy type, but you get stir-crazy working as a web designer staring at a glowing screen in your tiny apartment all day. One weekend, an old buddy extended an invite out to his family's secluded cabin up in the Olympic National Forest. Sounded like the perfect escape. Now, my buddy Kale has always been a bit peculiar. He's the kind of guy who has his finger on the pulse of the latest conspiracy theory or outlandish internet forum before anyone. The trip up was pretty uneventful miles of old-growth forests and winding logging roads. Kale chatted non-stop about strange disappearances reported in the area, something about missing hikers never being found. I tried to humor him. You need patience with that sort of thing when it comes to Kale. After we arrived at the cabin, however, it became harder to be so dismissive. This wasn't the cozy forest hideaway I had imagined. The place had a real sense of unease to it, Walls covered in old news clippings and maps marked up with cryptic symbols, rambling journal entries, faded Polaroid photos. I tried to piece it together. It seemed he was fixated on some local urban legend. Kale swore there was a connection between the old tales the indigenous people used to tell, recent disappearances and whatever dark secret he felt had settled over the area. That first evening, after a bit too much cheap beer and Kale's campfire ramblings, something weird happened. I'd woken up around two in the morning. The crackling of the dying fire and a strange humming noise made me step outside. I assumed it was the wind, but it sounded almost melodic. Now here's where things get blurry. 
It's like that moment just before a sudden jolt wakes you fully from a deep sleep. Part of me knew it wasn't right, that whatever produced that hypnotic drone wasn't natural. Then the clearing came into view, and that's when my memory falters. I know I saw something, a flash of… of what I cannot comprehend. It was all over in a flash. In fact, as the morning came and Kale tried to excitedly pick apart what little I claimed to remember, I started to believe I'd hallucinated the whole thing. Later on, we decided to take his rusty ATV into the woods to explore, to get a break from all the intensity back at the cabin. That's when we found it, an old hunter's shack, hidden deep amongst the trees. I felt a cold tingle down my spine. My nightmare from the night before seemed to play out right before my eyes. The place showed unmistakable signs of a struggle. Furniture was smashed, clothes strewn around, and dried blood splatters. Something violent had happened here. It wasn't an animal, they're less messy. We called it in. That was as involved as I wanted to be. As I headed back to my apartment a few days later, an unmarked vehicle approached Kale's place before I could leave. Men in suits got out, looking grim. It seemed a couple of hikers had gone missing near where we discovered the shack. It gave me chills because, well, let's just say there were too many weird coincidences stacking up for comfort. Kale, ever eager for vindication, rushed toward the men shouting something about conspiracies and evidence to back his claims up. They brushed him off, ignoring his desperate pleas. His demeanor shifted quickly as they drove away. Instead of his usual wild-eyed mania, I saw genuine horror reflected in his face. That scared me more than anything else so far. He turned back toward me before going inside, but all he said was a whispered, Don't go back. It seemed less like a buddy's warning and more like a terrified plea. A day later, the police were asking questions about Kale. Not because of the men in the unmarked car, but because he'd also disappeared. I still wonder, was he in danger? Maybe he figured something out, some chilling truth he couldn't live with. Or, the darker part of me whispers, had he become part of whatever shadowed those woods? In all honesty, I couldn't sleep in my apartment for months. It started to feel too suffocating, like eyes were always peering in through the windows. Sometimes at night, I catch a hint of that same low, almost rhythmic drone I heard near the cabin. Maybe it's just distant traffic, but the way it stirs that sick panic in the pit of my stomach, it reminds me that those deep woods hide things humans have no place understanding. It reminds me that there are always some questions better left unanswered. This happened a few years back while I was living in Alaska. Worked up there on one of the pipelines. Decent money, but isolated living in company housing outside Dead Horse. My name is Rhett, by the way. One weekend I decided to visit Juno. Never been further south in the state, figured a little urban life might shake off the cabin fever. So there I was in this little cafe overlooking the harbor when I overheard a story that changed my whole perspective on this state. I was grabbing a coffee before boarding the next ferry out, talking to the waitress when this old guy at the end of the counter piped in. Said he worked on cleanup missions, accidents during hunting, fishing, that sort of thing. Turns out the company sent him all over those southern islands after sightings. His tales got weird real fast. Talking about people, well, shredded might be the only description to fit. Never any animal tracks, but signs of a struggle. Signs of things getting dragged along. Locals blamed brown bears, of course, but he insisted there was something... different. Then he lowered his voice and started into these native legends of creatures that wore the skins of others. Things you only saw a flicker of as they vanished back into the trees. I laughed it off then. The waitress too, figuring maybe the guy had seen one too many accidents out there. But there was this look in his eye, like he believed it. Still a joke when I boarded the ferry. Less so a few hours later. You see... 
I got that wilderness explorer itch when we hit Wrangell. Decided to rent a truck, do a road trip up the Stikine River before grabbing the next boat. Figured some remote hiking might clear my head. Problem was, it was late spring, and snowmelt made the smaller highways pretty rough. About forty miles on, that rented Ford gave up the ghost. Dead engine, and my cell. No damn signal. Great. Had a pack with overnight gear, so that helped. At least I wasn't completely stranded. It was getting towards dusk, so I figured my best bet was to walk along the highway, try to flag down any traffic. Then came the realization. I hadn't seen another car, truck, hell, not even a stray dog since heading east out of town. I wasn't in prime bear territory, but... Well, that wasn't entirely reassuring. After maybe half an hour walking, something in the fading light caught my eye. Tracks in the mud on the side of the road. Big. Didn't fit a wolf. Didn't match the brown bear prints we got back at the pipeline. I squatted down and examined them. Long toes, five of them, with some pretty serious claw marks. There had to be a rational explanation. A stray husky cross. Something may be injured, that's what I told myself. Except for the size and the fact that all the prints headed one way. Into the trees. That's when it clicked. Just how big of an idiot I was being. There's no cell service out here. Maybe that old guy in the cafe wasn't full of it after all. Kept walking after that, faster than before. Sun was going down, casting long shadows that seemed to shift and flicker at the edges. I'd scan the tree line, get that creeping sense I was being watched. Had that old hunting rifle my granddad gave me strapped to my pack, gave me some comfort as I picked up the pace. Just wanted to find a clear view to set up a quick camp. Anywhere away from those trees. I wish that had been the moment my luck changed. But as I rounded a bend, I came face to face, maybe thirty feet away with this... thing. Tall, hunched over like a big cat ready to pounce, but wrong all over. Too slender, limbs oddly proportioned, and covered in coarse, dark fur. Then there were the eyes, amber glinting in the twilight, filled with, not exactly anger, but an unnatural sense of appraisal. And it stood bipedal, like a mockery of a human. It didn't growl, didn't charge, just took me in. I remember my body reacting before my mind, shouldering the rifle, firing, two quick shots, and it vanished. No roar, no whimper, just gone. I stood there, panting, heart pounding. Had I finally cracked? Imagine the whole thing thanks to too much isolation and tall tales. Then I went where it stood. No blood, no disturbed branches, but prints. Huge, fresh ones, heading off at unbelievable speed into the thickest part of the woods. That's when I bolted, ran all the way back to the truck, rifle useless as some comfort blanket in my shaking hands. Slept in the cab, fitfully. No idea if that thing stalked me in the night. I did have nightmares of those glowing eyes. Maybe that was even worse. By dawn, I was heading west, back towards civilization. I swore there was the impression of a face staring back at me from the trees as I got back onto the main highway. There was a police post in Wrangell. That's what people expect, right? You go, make a report about some monster out in the woods? No thanks. They'd put me in one of those psych units faster than you can say psychotic break. Never spoke of it again to anyone. I went back to that job at the pipeline. Kept my nights inside that company housing. Tried to bury that memory behind routine and boredom. Maybe I convinced myself there's some logical explanation. A trick of the light. A mutated predator driven out from the deeps by some accident. Doesn't make it any less real. Doesn't make me walk under the open sky without that hair-raising shiver on the back of my neck. There's part of me that knows. Some primal instinct that recognizes those legends are a warning and that what stalks those wild forests ain't any damn animal. The old guy with his cleaned-up corpses understood, even if none of the educated types would believe him. And sometimes at night, I stare out my window, 
northwards towards those misty mountains and think about it. Out there, under the stars. The Skinwalker. November 8, 2003. Figured I'd earned some peace and quiet after ten years in the Marines. Got myself a remote plot of land up in the Boundary Waters, pristine wilderness on the edge of Minnesota. Figured I could build a cabin, live a simple life, fish, hunt, leave the world behind. Name's Garrett. First summer went smooth enough, got the cabin built, felt that bone-deep contentment a man gets from living off the land, providing for himself. Then the disappearances started. A park ranger, a couple of campers on an extended hike, all vanished without a trace. Search parties combed the woods, turned up nothing. Folks whispered about cougars, wolves getting bolder with winter coming on. I wasn't so convinced. One crisp fall morning, I stumbled across the reason why. Found what was left of Jedediah, another off-gridder a few miles over. Jed was tougher than a boiled boot, could track anything and knew the woods like the back of his hand. What I found of him was strewn across his campsite, like a wild animal had... had exploded him. Blood was splattered all over, and his half-eaten remains looked like nothing I'd seen in all my tours overseas. The worst part were the footprints. Huge, clawed things, bigger than any human's. That's when I knew something unnatural was out there. Something that didn't fit our understanding of the world. I bolted back to my cabin, barricaded myself in, rifle clutched in sweaty hands. Figured it was just a matter of time before it came for me. Nights were sheer hell. Every crack of a branch, every rustle of the wind had me jumping, thinking it was that thing circling, hunting. I saw it once, a hulking shape under the pale moonlight its eyes reflecting back at me like glowing embers. It was easily eight feet tall, covered in coarse fur, with a muzzle stretched into a horrifying parody of a wolf's. That snarl echoed through my nightmares. The siege went on for days. It battered at the walls, tore at the roof, its ragged breathing a constant soundtrack to my terror. I barely slept, barely ate, just huddled in a corner firing my rifle blindly whenever I thought it got too close. Maybe it was playing with me, like a cat with a mouse, or maybe it simply couldn't find a way in. Either way, I knew I wasn't going to last much longer. Finally, on the fifth night, the noises stopped. Dead silence fell over the forest. I waited for hours, nerves screaming, but the thing never returned. At dawn, I cautiously ventured outside, rifle at the ready. The ground around the cabin was shredded, but there was no sign of the creature. I didn't stick around to find out if it would come back, left everything behind, just started walking. Hitchhiked, hopped freight trains, did whatever it took to get as far away from that place as possible. Ended up in a crummy apartment in a nameless city, surrounded by noise and concrete, a world away from the life I wanted. Sometimes, lying here in the stale city air, I almost miss the quiet of the woods. But then I remember Jedediah's remains, the creature's blazing eyes in the darkness, its bone-rattling snarl. I remember the feeling that I wasn't being hunted like prey, but by something far more intelligent, something that enjoyed the thrill of the chase. No, the city's fine with me. I don't sleep much, and I jump at every shadow. But at least the monsters here wear human faces, ones you can understand, plan against. Out there, in the wild, lonely places, there are horrors older than cities, older than humanity. And the worst part is, after seeing what I saw, part of me knows they're real. Folks in the Boundary Waters whisper about the Wendigo, a ravenous spirit from the old legends. Whatever it was, I know this. I never want to lay eyes on it again. I woke up to the sound of laughter echoing from deep within the woods. My name is Makya Anaya, 
and I was lying on the ground near my tent in Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, South Dakota. A guitar session with friends had turned into a lively night, and they had retreated back to their respective tents, leaving me under a blanket of stars. Come on out! Someone shouted in the distance. I tried to assess who it belonged to, but my memory seemed hazy after last night's merrymaking. Just yesterday, I had arrived at our family's reservation after many years away. Pangs of nostalgia compelled me to appreciate the familiar surroundings. The scent of pine trees, crisp mountain air, and soothing native melodies once sung by my grandmother. During my time living off the reservation, I'd worked as an ER nurse at a city hospital, saving lives and witnessing countless tragedies. Slowly, I stood up and squinted for a clearer view. To my surprise, I saw a pair of eyes staring back at me through the darkness. As they got closer, I realized that it wasn't a human staring back, but something much more sinister. The creature was unlike anything I'd ever seen before, towering over seven feet tall with muscular limbs covered in thick black fur. Its elongated snout housed razor-sharp teeth that glistened under the silver moonlight while its nose twitched with each ragged breath. My instincts kicked in. I knew that whatever this creature was, it posed a grave danger. Before it could make its move on me, I sprinted towards one of the nearby tents calling out for help. Josiah! Jonah! There's something out here! But no response came from my friend's tents. I felt dizzy as though some invisible force prevented them from hearing me. Desperate to protect myself and warn others about what lurked within these woods, I grabbed a hunting knife that had been left behind from the previous day's barbecue and tried to fend off this formidable foe. As the creature lunged at me, I skillfully evaded its strike and slashed its side with my knife. Letting out an agonizing roar as blood gushed from its wound, it forced me towards another nearby bush where I saw something chilling, the maimed body of our friend Layla. Stumbling upon her mutilated corpse was shocking, and my heart raced in panic. Whoever or whatever was responsible for this monstrous act needed to be stopped before the rest of our friends met a similar fate. But there was no time for sadness or grief. Cornered and on high alert, my priority was survival. The creature's ghastly growl echoed through the forest, prompting me to shovel dirt into its face in a desperate attempt to impair its vision momentarily. As it thrashed about in anger, clawing at its eyes, I sought refuge and found Kaya and Tati, two fellow Native American brothers who were also part of our reserve. They were just as alarmed by the earlier commotion. What is that thing? Kaya shouted above the chaos while Tati tried dialing 911 only for their calls to be met with silence due to poor reception in the woods. Panicking, we knew we had to get out of there and find help. Wasting no more time, the three of us sprinted deeper into the woods, trying to keep ahead of the menacing creature. It wasn't long before we stumbled upon another harrowing scene, the body of another one of our friends, Peter, his lifeless eyes staring back at us. Overwhelmed with the grisly sight, Kaya's determination surged. We need to find a way out, he panted. Toddy agreed, but after a few failed attempts to reach emergency services on his phone, we realized we were on our own. We had no choice but to push forward in hopes of escape. As adrenaline coursed through our veins, we hastily made our way toward the forest's edge. The creature relentlessly pursued us. Every rustle of leaves or snap of a branch felt as though it was just inches away. Tati stopped suddenly, holding his arm up for us to pause. He pointed off in the distance. There's a road. If we can get there, maybe someone will drive by and help us. With this glimmer of hope dangling before us, we raced onward. The creature appeared once more as we neared the road. Its fangs were dripping with blood and saliva, its body covered in matted fur that rippled with its every movement. Though it was reminiscent of an otherworldly beast from nightmares, it didn't seem to possess any paranormal abilities, simply physical might that surpassed anything we had ever seen. As we finally reached the road, Tati flagged down a passing truck, 
while Kaya and I kept our eyes on the forest line. The driver saw our panic-stricken faces and quickly pulled over, ready to assist us however he could. The creature stopped at the forest's edge and studied us from afar for what felt like an eternity. For reasons unknown, it did not venture any closer. As we piled into the truck's cab, my last glance at the monster was one of part terror, part amazement. It vanished back into the shadows of the trees. The truck driver named Bill listened in shock as we recounted the nightmarish events. He could hardly believe it, but given Layla and Peter's violent deaths, he understood our urgency and raced to the closest town. We were safe for now, but felt an overwhelming sense of loss for our friends who weren't so lucky. Days later, after finally returning home and taking time to mourn our losses, I began researching various predatory animals in hopes of identifying what terrorized us that fateful night. Though I'd never been one for folklore or mythology, I couldn't help but feel drawn to any information on it that could provide answers. However, no answer came easily. I failed to find any existing creature that resembled what we encountered. My research on biology and zoology left me with more questions than answers. But one thing was clear. Whatever this monstrous beast was, it eluded classification by defying all known traits of nature's catalogued beasts. As my mind churned with thoughts of the creature, every part of me wished I could go back in time and prevent our friends from ever making a trip to those woods. Layla and Peter deserved better. They deserved life, a future flushed away in mere moments at the hands of that wild monstrosity. Still struggling to understand the events that unfolded during our encounter with the creature in the woods, how it hunted us relentlessly yet seemed almost hesitant when we reached the road, a worry gnaws at me. What if this creature returns? What if more people fall victim to its ruthless presence? Determined not to let such a tragedy befall others again, Kaya, Tati and I have vowed to do whatever it takes to prevent anyone from getting too close to those woods. The nightmare won't be forgotten, and the memory of our dear friends Layla and Peter will live on as a reminder of the horrors lurking in the darkness. The creature may remain unidentified, but I know one thing for certain. We've witnessed a savage beast that defies all explanation. Throughout my search for answers, I realize it's best left alone. Nature has its secrets, and sometimes, the reasons for those secrets are better left undiscovered. I settled into my role as a fire lookout in the Bitterroot National Forest, with a sense of isolation that went beyond physical solitude. My name, Calhoun, was just as rare as the quiet moments between calls on the radio. My past had been filled with the hustle and noise of Billings city life, but out here, I could almost hear the trees growing. One evening, with the setting sun casting long shadows across the forest floor, a crackling dispatch broke the silence. A camper was reporting something unsettling at a nearby site. He struggled to put it into words. I locked up my tower and descended quickly, curiosity overriding caution. Near the campsite, crimson splashed across rocks and leaves spoke of violence yet offered no clue as to what had transpired. There was no cacophony here, just the deadened air of a scene paused. I noticed belongings scattered, a tent half collapsed, food spilling from an overturned cooler. Then came laughter from behind a tree, and an older man emerged, introducing himself with bemusement as merit. Despite my questions, he only scratched his beard and offered an incongruous joke about bears making poor thieves for lacking pockets. The humor fell flat given the grisliness before us. As dusk turned to nightfall under the canopy of evergreens, I patrolled around, radioing updates back to my superiors and gathering evidence meticulously. Instead of a mythical creature striking fear into hearts with supernatural howls or spectral presences, what kept me glancing over my shoulder was real, silent, an expert at hiding in these woods. Unseen dangers weaved through my imagination fed by each oddity. 
footprints that ended abruptly, fabric caught on bark like a cruel marker. The pulse of these woods had changed. Ever since that call came in, Merritt's odd demeanor aside, the forest felt like it was holding its breath, and I with it. With my flashlight's beam cutting swaths through darkness, my search for answers led me deeper away from beaten paths. Any given shadow could be hiding a creature or person responsible for the chaos left behind at camp. Every so often, Merritt would pop up from nowhere, his timing too perfect, as if land and man were playing some morbid game of hide-and-seek. Was he friend or fiend? That line blurred within these trees where motives and sanity tangled like undergrowth. Just when I thought I grasped this madness's tale, a scream echoed, one that was cut from reality's cloth, one that brought every nerve to attention. It seemed Merritt had found our elusive antagonist or victim, whichever held truth in this dark flipbook. I reached for my radio, fingers closing on air. It was gone lost to the forest floor. No signal out here anyway. Trees like bars to the outside world. The scream hung heavy among the pines, singular and chilling. Stay where you are, Merritt called from someplace unseen, his voice strained. In the dim light, something moved. It stood at the edge of my flashlight's reach, a shape too large, too wrong to be human, fur matted with blood eyes that glinted in predatory hunger. The creature's breath came out in heavy grunts as it surveyed me, an animalistic appraisal of prey. Merritt appeared then, keeping a distance. Back off slowly, he said, voice low but eyes never leaving the creature's gaze. No match for this brute force. No weapon would even the odds. I nodded and took a step back, then another. Suddenly it charged speed deceptive for its size. Merritt yelled. A tangle of motion erupted, him against it. The struggle fierce, the sounds visceral, wet. I fled, not proud but alive. From a neighbor's phone miles away, I reported what I could, a bear attack perhaps. But I knew this beast was no ordinary bear. Merritt never emerged from those woods again. Remembrance tightened around me, not just his odd jokes, but his knowledge of these paths and how he'd kept me from going left when we should have gone right. The forest has changed again. It holds its breath for different reasons now, for the loss it hides in its dense embrace and for the threat that lurks within. A reminder that not all tales need firelight to exist. Some walk on silent paws amongst the trees. This happened to me a couple of years back. Now even telling it feels almost absurd. I'm a city guy, always have been. My idea of roughing it involved hotel room service with less than five stars. Yet there I was, out in some boondock park with my girlfriend, her stupid idea of a romantic anniversary weekend. Let's call my girlfriend Talia. Talia's the granola and yoga type found some backwoods RV rental place tucked away online and went on this whole nature detox kick. Turns out this backwoods place was somewhere up in the Appalachian Mountains. Beautiful, sure, if you don't mind the mosquitoes. My name is Ryan, by the way. There were zero other campers the whole weekend, at least none that we saw. It was supposed to be serene, just the two of us reconnecting with the great outdoors, yada yada. First evening wasn't too bad. Had a campfire, the works. But something was off. Not like creepy guy behind the tree feeling. It was the sounds. They were different from what you expect in nature. No frogs or crickets, nothing like that. The forest felt dead quiet at night. Night two went downhill fast. Just after sundown, something big crashed through the brush by our RV. We both heard it. Talia swore it was a bear. Me? I thought it was more... upright? Sounded too light to be a bear. I poked my head out with a flashlight. Saw nothing. That's when the screaming started. It came from further up the mountain, high and piercing, 
like a woman caught in something horrible. It shut Talia up quick. We huddled inside for an hour until everything went quiet again. I got some crappy sleep, trying to convince myself it was just wildlife, maybe a mountain lion or something. My dumb city instincts kept saying otherwise, the way the screaming had faded, like the source of the sound had moved back further up the mountain. Talia refused to budge the next morning. I guess that nature detox of hers wasn't going as planned. I started packing us up, figuring the sooner we got back to civilization, the better. We'd only half-eaten the freeze-dried camping meals on the way out. We had plenty of time, so a detour back into town sounded wise. We figured that would calm Talia down anyway. Worst decision of my life. About five miles north of the entrance to the park, I came around a bend and nearly swerved off the road. Something had been dragged across the asphalt. Blood and this greasy brown mess was smeared everywhere, along with bits, well... Hard to say what they were. I slammed the brakes, heart pounding. Then I saw the shoe. A red women's tennis shoe, covered in mud, lying in the middle of the road. It was then that I truly knew we needed to get the hell out of there. I threw it in and drove like a bat out of hell until we hit the nearest town's outskirts. It took the sheriff a long time to appear. It probably looked ridiculous. City folks, probably still smelling of wood fire, rambling about something they barely saw out in the woods. But he gave us a look. One that told me he'd heard plenty like it before. It's hard to ignore two terrified idiots and a blood-smeared shoe, I guess. He listened intently to my frantic descriptions about the night screaming and the woman's shoe. Folks, his voice was tired. I won't tell you there's nothing. People, stuff out in those mountains just disappears sometimes. Don't make no sense. I know what y'all saw wasn't no bear. He patted Talia's shoulder and looked me square in the eye. There are things best not understood. Best to never come back this way, hear me? It turns out we weren't unique. Turns out that was hiker number four that was missing from the last couple of months. They never did find any bodies. I read those newspaper reports months later, the cold chill crawling back as I remembered that lonely shoe in the road. Talia and I split soon after, nature detox and all that. I guess not every relationship is meant to survive the mountains. There are places the locals don't go for a reason. But that screaming, I couldn't shake it. I kept remembering the way it echoed, moving higher and deeper into the woods. Not even in my worst nightmares can I recreate that sound. Not quite human, not quite animal. But sometimes, just as I begin to drift off to sleep, I think I hear it again, faint and echoing off the concrete walls of my city apartment, that chilling reminder that my worst nightmare could still be out there, waiting. I walked into Edgewood Forest, a lesser-known reserve area in Montana, to search for my cousin Kaya, who had gone missing two days ago. My name is Chayton, and I've lived on this Native American reservation my entire life. Kaya and I would often explore these woods during our childhood. It felt like a second home to us, but now the same trees that we used to climb seemed eerily ominous. As I ventured deeper into the forest, I stumbled upon a peculiar set of tracks, half human and half animal. It grabbed my attention at once, but something didn't feel right about following them. As a park ranger in the community, I knew every detail of these woods, yet these tracks were unrecognizable. What do you make of these? I asked my friend Mila who was helping me with the search. She squinted at the ground carefully. I don't know, Chayton she whispered, but it's the only lead we have. The tracks finally led us to a small cave hidden amongst thick bushes. Dried blood stained the entrance. The sight sent shivers down my spine. Crawling in one by one, 
we found ourselves in an enclosed room with walls covered in tribal paintings depicting an unusual creature with sharp claws and six legs. Is this what made those tracks? Mila asked tentatively. I don't know, I replied honestly. But the more we observed our surroundings, the more it seemed as though that creature was somehow involved in Kaya's disappearance. Suddenly, Mila suggested that we call for backup. Still stubbornly skeptical about its existence, I decided against it. What if there's a rational explanation behind all this, I argued. Without wasting any more time on debates, we continued to follow the trail of strange tracks through uncharted parts of Edgewood Forest. As daylight gradually turned to dusk, a blood-curdling scream echoed through the trees. In the growing darkness, we traced the source of the noise to an old abandoned cabin. My initial skepticism was now replaced by fear as we cautiously stepped inside. Shadows danced on the walls, creating images that resembled the creature from the cave paintings. The horrifying noises continued to reverberate throughout, inciting dread in every corner of my being. We decided to remain silent so as not to alert the potential attacker nearby. Eventually, we found another set of tracks that led deeper into the cabin, and there, in its center, we discovered Kaya's lifeless body with eerie claw marks across her chest. Horrified by our gruesome discovery, I shouted angrily at Mila, This thing is real! We can't be here! We need help! Despite my disbelief earlier, I couldn't deny the existence of this beast anymore. It had already taken Kaya away from us, who knows what else it was capable of. You're right, Mila agreed quietly. But before we go back for help, let's make sure there are no other victims here. With extreme caution, Mila and I searched the old cabin, hoping there were no other victims. Kaya's lifeless body haunted me, and I couldn't shake off the feeling of dread. Let's check upstairs, Mila whispered as we approached a rickety staircase. Each step creaked loudly under our weight, making us more nervous with every inch we climbed closer to the second floor. Reaching the top, we slowly scanned the surroundings. If more people were in danger, we needed to know. An open door at the far end of the hallway caught our attention, and together we crept closer. Inside the room were three other people, two adults and a child, all bound and gagged. They looked terrified, obviously aware of their captor's brutal intentions. We hurriedly untied them, urging them to stay quiet. I whispered to them, We have to get out of here now. There's a creature that killed Kaya. We can't stay. The adults nodded their understanding while fear filled the child's eyes even further. We led them down the stairs, avoiding any unsettling noises. As we came together near the entrance, we all paused for a moment. The creature could be lurking outside, waiting for us. It was at that moment when Mila suggested, We should call for help now, otherwise none of us will make it out alive. Realizing she was right, I pulled out my phone and dialed an emergency number. When someone answered on the other end, I explained our predicament in hushed tones but with urgency. Stay where you are, instructed the operator on the line after hearing about Kaya and the creature stalking outside of town in Edgewood Forest. A rescue team is on its way. While waiting for help to arrive, we barricaded ourselves inside one room along with our new companions. We exchanged glances full of dread and anticipation at every sound echoing throughout the cabin. Time seemed to move at a snail's pace. Finally, we heard the faint sounds of vehicles approaching, soon followed by voices beyond the cabin walls. They called our names, waiting for any response. I shouted back with all my might, We're in here! Moments later, the rescue team burst inside. They rushed us out of the dangerous hideaway and into the safety of their vehicles. As we moved away from the cabin, sweat dripped down my temples from exhaustion and relief. Sirens wailed behind us as we drove to the nearest town. The rescue team questioned us about the creature that had killed poor Kaya. Reluctantly, I shared everything we knew. 
a beast born from nightmares it seemed, had escaped and left death in its wake. I couldn't stop thinking about whether or not this monster would attack again. However, one thing was certain. We had survived and managed to save others along with us. The nightmare-inducing creature had yet to be apprehended as authorities began their brutal hunt using our description as guidance. Were it not for Mila and our realization to call for help in time, there could have been four more gruesome deaths that night in Edgewood Forest. As for Kaya, who was brutally taken from us by such a horrifying creature, her memory will never be forgotten among those who fought against darkness, with hope and fear surging within them. The night was over, but we knew that out there somewhere in the darkness lay a villain waiting to strike again. This happened to me about six months ago, back when I was taking a solitary hike in the Appalachian Mountains of West Virginia. I had always found solace in nature, and the peaceful quiet gave me an escape from the pressures of my job and recent divorce. My name is Harold Zumwalt, by the way, a simple man who loves his peace. During my hike, I met two fellow travelers, Clara Markowitz and Vincent Rappaport. We connected briefly over our shared interest in hiking and agreed to explore a less traveled route together. The trail looked promising, abundant with flora and lush green vegetation that blanketed the landscape. Despite being seasoned hikers, none of us had done any real research on the specific route we were taking. Our journey took us through dense forests with twisted trees reaching for the sky. The terrain grew steeper and rockier. We laughed often, sharing jokes and stories as the sun dipped below the horizon, painting the sky brilliant shades of orange and gold. As nightfall closed in around us, we made camp beside a babbling brook. Its soothing gurgles lulled us to sleep, at least until midnight, when I woke to strange noises echoing through the forest, unsettling rustling and snapping branches that sent shivers down my spine. I nudged Clara and Vincent awake. Something's off, I said quietly. Have either of you heard sounds like that before? They shook their heads. We decided to investigate together. As we crept closer to the sounds, we discovered deep tracks gouged into the earth, as if something heavy had been dragged along now partially illuminated by moonlight. We exchanged nervous glances, but persisted in our pursuit. Our hearts hammered as we continued following the tracks until they led us straight to a cave entrance littered with jagged rocks, ominously stained dark splotches, which I chose not to think about too much. And that's when we saw them. Hulking shapes, barely visible in the dim moonlight. Their towering, malnourished, and filthy bodies were covered in animal skins, their faces hidden behind primitive masks. There were at least five of them, but it was hard to tell for sure. Clara clamped her hand over her mouth to stifle a gasp, but it was too late. They had heard us and turned our way. Their eyes glinted hungrily. We sprinted back towards our campsite, desperation driving us forward as we scrambled over the terrain. I briefly considered calling for help, but realized that no cell service was available this far into the wilderness. If we wanted to survive, we had to rely solely on our wits. We reached the campsite only to find that our packs had been torn open by wild animals attracted by the smell of food. The supplies that could have saved us were ruined. The cannibalistic mountain men hunted us relentlessly, laying traps, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. We did our best to evade their pursuit. However, each day, they drew closer. Some nights we could hear their guttural voices just beyond the darkness that enveloped our hastily assembled hiding places. One night as we rested under a canopy of leaves near a cliff's edge, Vincent whispered an idea. What if we create a diversion? Make it look like we've gone one way while slipping off in another direction? It was risky, but it seemed like our only hope. The next morning, Clara and I carefully laid a false trail veering south while Vincent kept watch up ahead. As evening approached, 
we snuck away from the ruse heading northward instead. But luck was not on our side. Our diversion had failed, or they doubled back. Mid-action, our trio faced an ambush near yet another dark cave entrance, where two of the mountain men appeared to corner us. Truthfully, we never had a chance. Vincent went down first, screaming as they mercilessly tore into him. Clara and I were paralyzed with fear as we watched the mountain men descend upon Vincent. A feeling of helplessness washed over me as their muscular, hairy bodies dismembered my friend. Their long, unruly hair and unkempt beards made it almost impossible to see their faces. Not that I wanted to, anyway. Remembering the cliff's edge behind us, I whispered to Clara, We have to jump. It's our only chance. There's no way, she replied in a trembling voice. It's either that or end up like Vincent, I said the urgency in my voice evident. Clara hesitated for a moment, but as one of the mountain men turned his attentions towards us, she knew it was our only option. We leaped from the cliff's edge, hoping that the fall wouldn't kill us instantly. Miraculously, we survived. The cold water of a rushing river broke our fall. We struggled in the strong current and eventually found ourselves being swept downstream. The following days were a blur of exhaustion. We scavenged for food. The occasional berries and edible plants we found helped keep us alive. We knew we needed to find help, but each noise from the wilderness reminded us that those monstrous mountain men could still be pursuing us. Our desperation grew with each day, until finally, we happened upon a ranger station by sheer luck. It almost felt too good to be true. Our journey through this hellish landscape could finally be over. I managed to stand in front of the ranger station door with Clara supporting me. My muscles ached from exhaustion and pain as I knocked feebly on the wooden door. Please, we need help! I yelled in between gasps for air. A tall man with short gray hair opened the door cautiously. What happened? I tried to speak, but tears filled my eyes as memories of Vincent and our ordeal came flooding back. Clara spoke up instead. We were attacked by... by... I don't know... some mountain men? They killed our friend and we barely escaped. Please, we have been out here for days. We just want to go home. The ranger eyed us with a mix of suspicion and pity before allowing us inside. He offered us water and dry clothes before making a call for help on his walkie-talkie. It wasn't long before other rangers appeared whisking us off to medical staff that treated our wounds and fed us a proper meal. We told them about Vincent, despite struggling to revisit the horrors we experienced. They promised they would search for him, or at least recover his body. A few days later, we were transported back to civilization. As I sat in the back seat of the car that took us away from those dreadful woods, I couldn't help but think about Vincent his bravery in the face of those bloodthirsty mountain men and the price he paid trying to save me and Clara. It was difficult to accept that we were the only survivors of our weekend getaway, but as I glanced at Clara, I saw the newfound strength in her eyes despite her body still recovering from all that we had endured. We had been through an unimaginable nightmare, surviving against all odds when hope was but a flicker in the dark wilderness. As we left that cursed place behind, I knew that our lives would never be the same again. But Vincent's sacrifice would always be a reminder of what it meant to stand against evil in its most primal form. I made a silent promise to always carry his memory with me as I regained my life beyond those treacherous mountains. Vincent would not be forgotten, and neither would our story. I had never heard silence quite like it. The stillness of the Ho rainforest, disturbed only by the occasional rustling of leaves or distant snap of twigs underfoot. That's what I kept telling myself it was anyway. My name's Saxton Dale, a fire lookout assigned to the Olympics in Washington State. You learn to enjoy solitude in this job, but that night was different. It felt as if the serenity was suffocating me. I got into this line of work to escape. Debts, ex-wife, a past I wasn't proud of. 
Up here, you don't just watch for fires. You keep tabs on your thoughts, too. I was settled into my tower when I heard an unfamiliar noise. Not an animal, more mechanical, rhythmic, tapping. I strained my ears against the fabric of the night to pinpoint the sound, but instead met a thick wall of quiet. My only companion up here was Carson Delaney, another lookout from a neighboring peak some miles off. He was an old-timer, preferred books over people. Said conversation hampered his ability to listen to nature's whispers. Carson and I developed a shorthand. Three blinks with our spotlights meant all clear. Two blinks were an invitation for coffee and chatter. That night had been solid three blink exchanges. I radioed in to report the odd noise when his aged voice crackled through. Saxton, you getting this tapping nonsense? Thought it was just me, I replied. There was comfort in knowing Carson heard it too. Solidarity and confusion, if nothing else. As morning broke, the tapping faded into memory until I found human-like tracks near the base of my tower, unshod feet too large for any person that danced across muddy terrain, with no fear of the cold or debris. No one ventured out this far unprepared. It didn't make sense. I shared descriptions with Carson over coffee. Sounds like a mimicry artist, messing with us out there. His humor couldn't lift the tension seeping into my bones. That evening's patrols bore marks of disturbance, broken branches arching toward my tower with purposeful aggression, trash from campsites strewn about but no sign of campers. The isolation was casting doubts on my reason like never before. Days turned darker as subtle intrusions punctuated each night's silence, scuffling against wooden beams and shadows darting out of reach when discovered by flashlight. My uneasy sleep ruptured by grasping breaths nearby that held no source when sought out at dawn. It all came to a head one stifling night when through binoculars I spied motion at Carson's tower, flickering beams signaling three blinks. Yet shadowed figures skulked beneath his structure as if savoring his obliviousness above. Saxton, they're here! Carson's voice trembled over the radio as reality set in. We weren't alone up here, but both too far from help or each other. A plan formed rapidly. Meet halfway. Use our knowledge as defense. I locked the door, heart beating hard. Carson was miles away. I couldn't reach him in time. I had to call for help. Davis Peak, this is Saxton Tower. Emergency. Send someone fast. Copy Saxton Tower. What's your situation? Intruder at Carson's Tower, I said. I can't explain, but it's bad. The dispatcher promised quick action, but the distant patrol would take hours to reach us. Night fell and my isolation was complete. No sign of help yet. Then a loud crack echoed below my tower. It approached in steady bursts. It wasn't an animal but something else that knew how to terrify. The creature appeared from the trees, its form huge and stooped, muscles bunched under skin too tight for its frame. Its face was shadowed by the control room light, but I saw teeth, rows of them, shining dully in reflected light. It didn't see me immediately. It was fixated on ripping metal plates off the bottom of my tower. The structure shook with each pull. I remembered Carson, dialed his frequency. Carson, get down. Get out now. His reply was cut short by a scream that ended abruptly. Communication died with static. Minutes passed with no word from Carson and none from help either. The creature now noticed my presence, turning its gaze up toward me, eyes devoid of anything human. It climbed effortlessly, reaching my floor quickly, its teeth gnashing inches from the reinforced glass. Sirens wailed in the distance, salvation, but too far away. The glass started to crack under relentless pressure from outside. The door to the stairs gave way suddenly. Calls for help were no good anymore. I saw Carson's hat amid debris opposite my tower window, confirming his fate. As the creature forced its way through broken glass, law enforcement arrived below. Shouts filled the air. Get away from the window! 
It lunged at me just as bullets hit home. It stumbled backward into darkness beyond my sight. Morning revealed emergency teams securing both towers and tending to what remained of Carson below his shattered lookout point. Weeks later, as I recovered in the hospital from deep cuts and a fractured leg, reports surfaced about an escaped scientific experiment from a private facility miles away. Something powerful they'd been growing that got out of control. They called it a genetic aberration. Those of us who survived knew it simply as horror made real. There was no closure, just memories of tapping echoes in those eyes full of malice that haunt to this day. Carson wasn't forgotten. He stands testament to human fragility when faced with monsters we create ourselves. This happened to me a few years ago. Looking back, the whole thing seems ridiculous. The type of tale you brush off with a nervous laugh in company. Of course, at the time, it was far from laughable. I'm a city guy, born and bred. The idea of getting close to nature fills me with an odd mix of anxiety and boredom. That said, my cousin Joel talks a good game when it comes to the beauty of the real America. And well, my wife Karen, bless her, wanted to make him happy. It was his fortieth, after all. Thus, in what can only be described as a lapse of judgment, I found myself wedged into an oversized RV, heading through the vast, open spaces of the Nevada desert. Not my scene at all. Now Joel, he was like a kid at Christmas. My aunt and uncle even chipped in. They rented the thing specifically because he's never been out of the city before, except for one time visiting Grandma. Bless their hearts. First couple of days weren't so bad. Mostly driving. There's not much to do inside one of those glorified buses but eat and sleep. I felt bad for Karen. She got stuck navigating these little back roads while the rest of us chilled out. Finally, we got close to Joel's dream destination. A place called Red Rock Canyon. He couldn't stop talking about the formations, the hikes. Honestly... It all sounded like different shades of brown to me. But hey, keeps him smiling. We picked a spot just off the trail, a real remote kind of place. Sun's low in the sky, casts long shadows on the boulders. It's quiet, peaceful almost. Then my aunt notices. The tires slashed. We check them all, and another's been cut clean down the side. At this point, doubt sinks in. It couldn't be an accident. We're stranded, miles from civilization on purpose. My stomach knots up. We gotta get help, I insist. I look to Joel, Karen, there's fear in their eyes too, but there's no cell service. Not surprising out here, of course, but a punch in the gut nonetheless. Night rolls in faster than you'd think in the desert. We rig up with flashlights, but darkness in a place like that there's a type of heaviness to it. Every rustle in the brush makes me jump. Karen stays tight by my side. You feel vulnerable, exposed. I swear I hear voices out there, low whispers on the wind, carrying on the night air. But whenever we chase the sound, nothing. My mind works overtime, conjuring up images of some backwoods lunatic stalking us. Maybe it's just the stress playing with my head. That's when the rock hits the RV. A solid thump echoes through the metal shell. Then another, and another. We huddle together, unsure what to do. It stops as suddenly as it started. Joel cracks a worried joke trying to lighten the mood. Guess someone wanted our parking spot. Doesn't quite land. That night, none of us sleeps easily. Every little creak and groan feels like someone circling, closing in. I know, it sounds pathetic, but you try being there and see how calm you stay. Morning light brings no relief, only rising dread. It's decided, we'll try to hike out. We pack essentials, water mostly, and leave a note under the windshield. I explain the tires, tell whoever finds it we left on foot for the nearest town. 
we'd rather take our chances walking than stay there another night. Trail winds between giant sandstone formations, like colossal red teeth flanking the path. With every turn, I keep glancing over my shoulder, expecting to see... I don't even know what I expect to see. Maybe a figure lurking just out of sight. I find myself checking my watch even though time has practically vanished in my internal clock of fear. We push on step by step. No talking. Just the sound of boots on rough earth. It's strange how even with company, I've never felt more alone. The sun bears down, the dry heat like a furnace blast with every gust of wind. We're not made for this kind of walking. I can see it in the others, in the slump of their shoulders, the slowing pace. My legs burn. There's something about being this exposed, under a sky this wide. It makes you feel insignificant. And then another flash of panic. Ahead on the trail, a dark stain. Not the red of the rocks, something deeper. And wet. We get closer and gasp in unison. There lies a bird. Wings splayed at awkward angles. Feathers matted with a thick crimson smear. I kneel down. The blood still sticky. Something killed this. And not long ago. Fear surges through me. A real primal response. My aunt starts sobbing, a mix of despair and terror. My voice gets rough as I command we turn back. Joel fights me on it for a moment, his stubbornness flaring up. They probably took pity, he tries to sound positive, slashed the tires so we wouldn't wander and then left when they realized. His sentence trails off. None of us buy it. There's malice in the act. I recognize it instinctively. This wasn't some misguided help. We retreat to the RV, hearts pounding, back to square one. A few more sleepless hours pass, and again the stones start hitting the metal. The pattern keeps up, relentless. I try to focus on the breathing of the others, to calm my ragged nerves. Then it changes. There's a scraping sound now, something dragging itself along the side. Karen whimpers beside me, and I pull her close, protectively. The noise persists, the scraping now interspersed with heavy, irregular thumps against the vehicle. Every bump makes the RV rock slightly, my imagination running wild. My heart thunders in my chest, and that's when I see it. Through the dusty window, there's a form outside. In the pale moonlight, a silhouette hulks by the door. Its shoulders are too broad, arms too long, and I could swear the head doesn't sit quite right. The way it moves isn't natural, a lurching, uneven gait. I can't make out details, but I know instinctively this isn't something natural, isn't some regular person wandering alone at night. The thing pauses, and it feels like my soul freezes in my chest. But then, it shuffles away, back into the night. There's a sound like claws dragging against metal as it moves, sending waves of dread through me. The sun's only a few hours off now, but we won't last until then. The thing, whatever it is, it comes back every night. It's playing with us. My mind runs in circles through impossible escape plans while simultaneously telling me we're doomed, that it's only a matter of time, that this night might well be our last. Dawn arrives in a smear of sickly gray. In those thin streaks of light, something shifts in me. I find a spark of determination, born from raw desperation. It can't end like this. There are some tools under the driver's seat. Basic stuff, not much we can make use of. One thing does catch my eye, though. A hefty lug wrench. If that thing comes close again, at least I have something more than my bare hands. I tuck it discreetly at my side and force myself to think. To plan. It's the only way I can stop my nerves from unraveling completely. By daylight... My aunt and uncle have given in to pure exhaustion. It feels heartless, but this gives me more room to work. It would be impossible to shield them while simultaneously confronting the, well, whatever it is lurking out there. That thought still shivers down my spine, 
even in the light of day. I tell them to make themselves as small as possible behind the seats, stay under cover, where they can't be seen through the windows. They obey with silent understanding, their eyes wide with terror-filled compliance. Karen squeezes my hand, her skin clammy. Just the touch brings a flicker of strength back. For her, we wouldn't give up without a fight. There's a cooler we managed to jam under the dashboard. I wrench it out. Inside are just a few melted snacks and warm water bottles. I take one and unscrew the lid. There's no grand plan here, just pure instinct. This water is our ammunition. Now for the hardest part, waiting. Time crawls. Even with the engine off, the desert heat bakes through the metal. Every minute drags like an hour. Every rustling shadow at the window makes my stomach clench. But somehow, the hours slip by without our nocturnal stalker returning. I realize it knows night is its time to play its cruel games. The light, even this weak daylight, offers some sort of protection. My nerves remain at full battle readiness, but a cautious flicker of hope burns beneath them. Sunset looms, casting long, jagged shadows across the rocks. My body goes rigid. With the dwindling light comes the realization, time's running out. The waiting for it might end up worse than the thing itself. Joel stirs from his exhausted slumber with a confused groan. Don't, I warn him, finger to my lips. The tension snaps around us like a live wire. I feel them behind me, eyes wide with that familiar mix of fear and confusion, all unspoken questions hanging thick in the hot, stale air of the RV. My hand tightens around the lug wrench. And then, there it is. The scrape of claws, the lurching silhouette appearing out of the deepening dusk. This time, it lingers by the driver's side window, peering directly in. I can't make out any features, just that sense of something horribly wrong, like a twisted distortion of a person. There's a hungry intentness there, something chillingly deliberate. That's the moment I break. Not in fear, but in pure, unbridled rage. With a primal yell, I launch myself forward, smashing open the door. I raise the wrench, ready to defend my family, myself, whatever. Even if it's a futile, suicidal act. But whatever intelligence exists in those shadowy eyes must recognize the shift, the desperate determination I hold. For a terrifyingly long moment, we stare each other down. It's like a duel with unimaginable stakes. In that moment, there's the flash of the water bottle against the backdrop of the darkening sky, an act born of instinct rather than reason. The splash makes it flinch, and even in the gloom, I see whatever skin I hit redden as if burned. Its lanky frame twists back, then melts into the night. Its retreat brings no satisfaction, no real sense of victory just bone-deep relief. My body sags against the RV, and there's a shaking I can't control. We survived another night. We wait until the first tentative streaks of dawn before daring to move. Joel takes over the wheel. I won't lie. My hands don't quite work right. It feels like another lifetime back on those smooth, paved roads. There's no cell service, but at least there are other cars, normal cars. Just seeing them feels like a lifeline. With luck, it wouldn't be too long before we are in eyesight of some semblance of civilization. It might just be our lifeline after all. We flag down a pickup truck, an older couple staring down curiously at our slashed tires. My story sounds insane, even as I'm saying it. The looks they exchange... I get it. I expect skepticism, a hint of amused accusation. Instead, their faces go pale, and there's a flicker of recognition in their eyes. Fear, and maybe a trace of pity. I want to demand answers, but they won't meet my stare. We exchange contact information just in case, then they're hurrying back to their car, 
casting fleeting glances towards the fading desert horizon. There are hushed whispers about local stories as we roll into a quiet town. Tales passed down, rumors about things glimpsed in the shadows out there. We get checked out at a clinic, treated for dehydration, mild shock. There are police reports, of course, and lots of unanswered questions. They look at us with a mix of skepticism and disbelief, like we're either lying or have lost our minds. I never saw the thing again. I won't pretend I believe my water bottle stunt chased it back to whatever lair it crawls in and out of. There's something out there in those empty spaces, in the margins of light and darkness. You wouldn't catch me willingly getting that close to finding out again. We stayed the night at a generic motel, clinging to the artificial hum of the lights like it was our sanctuary. There are whispers still, from that couple in the truck, from locals we ran into at the diner. Stories told in hushed tones about things out there in those vast, lonely landscapes. You're called dramatic, told you saw nothing, and maybe you start to doubt the experience yourself in the harsh clarity of day. But in those still, sleepless nights, the memory of that silhouette against the rising moon burns so vividly that even I start to question what is real and what's a trick of the night. But one thing I know with absolute certainty, there's no amount of city lights bright enough to erase that primal flicker of terror. The lingering sensation of being something out there in the desert darkness had us marked for its prey. This all happened a few summers back, just after I took an early retirement package. Had always been good with my hands. Construction type, the honest work that wears on an aging body. My name's Rhett Lawson, and after 30 years on various job sites, the idea of nothing on the agenda filled me with a mix of excitement and, frankly, worry. Kids are grown, live out far west, and with no prospects tying me down locally, well, the road always held a certain appeal. Not in a fancy RV like you see those silver-haired couples driving, more like my trusty old truck in a pop-up camper. Freedom on a shoestring budget, or so I told myself. I ended up in this little spot out in Arizona. Desert landscape. Stark, dry, but that sky stretched forever. There was one of those historic parks nestled among those rugged red rock formations, the type with scenic roads and the occasional interpretive sign marking past settlements. Camp wasn't crowded, mostly folks who kept to themselves. I even saw a couple coyotes skulking at dawn one morning, ears alert, and I figured being so close to nature was probably my closest bet to having an adventure during this whole endeavor. Funny how that word can take on multiple meanings, huh? Looking back, the first hint of things going sideways happened near twilight one evening. There's something eerie about how desert heat just evaporates, replaced by a stillness and air so crisp you hear every little sound. I'd built a small fire and settled against a pile of smooth, worn rocks, a beer close at hand. In the fading light, something moved on the distant ridge. My initial thought was a deer. They were common in these parts, but not with that loping gait. My pulse quickened as I strained my eyes, and the figure dropped lower, its limbs unnaturally thin and overly long. For a heart-stopping moment, I couldn't grasp what my instincts were already screaming. Not an animal. It was bipedal, but moved with inhuman jerks, as if its frame wasn't quite put together right. And those eyes, huge, unblinking, seeming to glow. Just as abruptly, it vanished. Swallowed by the encroaching darkness, fear prickled along my neck, my heart thumping hard against my ribs. Rationality warred with terror, yet my mind searched for familiar shapes and explanations, clinging to the possibility I must have misidentified the figure. Still, something had lurked at the edge of reason, leaving an imprint of pure disquiet in its wake. As a kid, I heard campfire tales, but even with a belly full of beer, nothing I could conjure even began to resemble the reality of what I saw. It felt wrong to stay out there, so exposed. 
After kicking dirt on the embers, I stumbled the short way back to camp. No sleep that night. Every snapping twig outside my flimsy camper shell sounding like the approach of claws. That's where my pride kicks in. The next morning, a part of me was determined to chalk it up to bad shadows and an overactive imagination. Decided to take a hike, get the blood pumping, get back to normalcy. I headed down one of the trails marked on the park map, winding between towering boulders and scraggly juniper. Despite the morning sun, that night clung to me, and every rustle of leaves set my heart pounding. I must have gone further than intended, and somehow lost the trail markers. It felt like ages before I finally broke free of the maze of rock and saw my truck through the scrub growth. Relief flooded through me, but as I got closer, I stopped short. There, clawed into the dusty metal hood, were strange marks too deep to be natural, and spaced erratically like misshapen hands might have made them. I circled the truck, seeing further etchings. Then, in the mud by the creek running alongside the camp, I nearly stepped on it. A mangled deer carcass, torn in a violent display of overkill, and on a flat stone, almost an offering, I noticed the coyote carcass from earlier, its head twisted backward at an impossible angle. Now, no logical part of me believed that my campfire sighting was to blame. Fear gave way to something colder, more determined. My gun was locked in a case back in the truck, and after fumbling with shaking hands to load it, I began to search. No more tracks or sign of that thing. No clear indication of where it might have disappeared to. It wasn't until much later that I found myself stumbling across websites devoted to strange phenomena to legends and reports of things lurking out in the darkness. There was a section on Native American beliefs, whispers of entities known as skinwalkers, shapeshifters of immense power who shed their true skin and walk in twisted forms. Those descriptions echoed back at me, long, unnatural limbs, animal-like, but all wrong. It felt absurd, even as it offered some bizarre form of justification a framework for something beyond my control. Maybe those old stories I scoffed at as a kid had more truth than I ever considered possible. I never went back to that park, of course. Every so often, the urge to hit the open road resurfaces, but that desert stretch haunts my dreams. Each shadow holds a potential terror, and there's a weight deep down that the old truck will never quite outrun. When darkness arrives, particularly out where there's nothing but wide open space and stars above, something within me knows there are corners of this world the light doesn't quite reach. Maybe it's fear that keeps me grounded now, or some newfound sliver of wisdom. No matter the reason it's made me cautious, wary of places too wild and too steeped in a silent history most choose to ignore. July 9th, 1991. Started with checking the trout lines just as the sun painted the sky over the boundary waters. Name's Lincoln. Folks used to call me Link back when I still cared for names. Off-grid life ain't some survivalist fantasy. It demands constant work. Gathering firewood, tending the small garden, repairing the leaky tin roof of my cabin. I came to this godforsaken slice of Minnesota wilderness for a reason and those reasons keep me sane on the lonely nights. My lines were slack, but that didn't bother me none. Mornings by the lake had a rhythm of their own, the mists swirling over the water, birdsong weaving through pines older than America itself, a peaceful sort of quiet. Then, a crash broke the silence. Branches shattering, a grunt that sent shivers down my spine. I ain't much of a praying man, but a whispered plea escaped my lips. There's bears, sure, big ones, but those don't stalk you on two legs. Hello? I called out, masking the tremble in my voice with a show of confidence. Nothing but the wind and rustling leaves answered. That was my first mistake. Back at the cabin, tools laid out for mending my boots, the unease festered. 
a glance at the old shotgun above the fireplace did little to calm me. I'd only used it for the odd grouse or to scare off critters raiding my supplies. Harming something more. Something bigger? That wasn't my way. Mistake number two. Sunset came and went, casting long shadows that twisted unnaturally between the trees. I barricaded myself inside, the shotgun loaded, fear a bitter lump in my throat. All night, something circled my cabin. Scratching at the walls, low rasping growls, the occasional bone-jarring thud that made the whole structure shake. Sleep was a luxury I couldn't afford. Come dawn, I risked a peek. The woods seemed still, that unsettling presence gone. But something about the light felt wrong, angles off. Then I saw it, a buck, or what was left of it. Hanging ten feet up a pine, stripped to the bone, streaks of crimson painting the bark. Too high for a cougar, too clean for wolves. And the smell, rot mixed with an underlying musk that snagged in my throat and set off every alarm bell in my body. I went back in, bolted the door, the scent clinging to my clothes. Now I knew. Whatever was out there, it wasn't an animal. It was something far more dangerous. A week I hunkered down, ran out of firewood, ate the last of my canned peaches, heart pounding every time a twig snapped outside. The creature toyed with me. It left half-eaten rabbits near the doorstep as if mocking my traps. Once, I caught a flash of it through the trees, huge, bipedal, hunched. Its eyes glinting in the dim light were the most chilling sight of my entire life. Human, yet not. Hunger and desperation outweighed fear. I had to get out, grab supplies in the nearest town, maybe figure out what the hell I was dealing with. Couldn't just wait around to become its next gruesome trophy. Nightfall was my chance. Packed meager essentials and slipped out under cover of darkness, shotgun clutched tight like a lifeline. The air crackled with unseen menace. I moved fast, navigating the familiar trails by instinct, moonlight filtering through the canopy. That's when I heard the woman scream. It sliced through the night, a high-pitched cry choked off abruptly. Every muscle locked. Those woods held my greatest fear, but that sound, it was primal, a terror beyond my understanding. The logical part of me whispered to stay on course, save my own skin, but the echo of my own haunted nights pounded in my skull. I couldn't leave her out there, not to that thing. Veered off the trail toward where the scream had faded. My breath rasped in the frigid night air. My legs burned, lungs ached, but I pushed harder. Panic sharpened my senses, making every rustle sound like approaching footsteps. I tripped, rolled, scrambled to my feet, scanning the darkness. A flicker of light up ahead. A campfire. Figures huddled close. Relief flooded me. Could it be a ranger patrol? Other campers? I burst through the final curtain of trees, my voice hoarse. Hey! I'm here! I heard! They weren't human. My words cut off as the scene before me finally registered. I stumbled back, gag reflex kicking in. Three mutilated bodies lay strewn about the clearing, clothes torn, their faces frozen masks of terror. Not just dead, but disfigured in ways my stomach couldn't handle. And surrounding them, the creatures. There were more than one, at least four, maybe five. They looked like the thing that stalked me, but also different. Same nightmarish bulk, those gnarled claws, the stench of death clinging to them. But some were taller, others squatter, fur ranging from jet black to a sickly gray. A pack. No, something worse. A family. The largest one turned, its eyes shining like yellow embers, fixed on me. A throaty rumble vibrated the air, part growl, part something I couldn't place. I raised the shotgun, hands shaking. They charged. My shots echoed in the night, panic overriding precision. I might have hit one, a jagged wound on its shoulder spraying dark blood. It let out a piercing screech, more enraged than injured. I fumbled to reload, fingers numb. 
There wasn't time. They were too fast, closing in like a ragged wave. An explosion of pain as one barreled into me, knocking the shotgun away. I hit the ground hard, gasping. Snarling teeth ripped at my leg. I thrashed, kicked, my boot connecting with bone. A satisfying crack followed by a howl. But I was outnumbered, outmatched. Claws raked my arms, tearing through my jacket. A crushing weight landed on my chest, squeezing the air from my lungs. I tasted blood. Above me, the creature who led the attack loomed, its jaw hanging impossibly wide, dripping. Blackness threatened to swallow me whole. With one final surge of desperate strength, I reached for the hunting knife sheathed on my belt. A blur of motion, a shriek that pierced my eardrums, cutting through the haze. It wasn't me who screamed. I blinked. The creature was reeling back, a ragged hole in its side. Through my disorientation, a figure materialized beside me. A man, wild-eyed and disheveled, but wielding a bloody axe. Get up! He roared, hacking at another creature that lunged at him. How he survived out here. How he found me. My addled brain couldn't process it. Instinct took over. I scrambled upright, leg throbbing, and grabbed the fallen shotgun. The beasts had a taste of blood now, their leader injured, fury twisting their grotesque forms. The stranger and I fought back to back. My aim improved now that adrenaline wasn't my only fuel. A blast to the face sent one creature staggering. The man's axe found its mark again and again, his movements brutal, efficient. Yet, they were relentless. One beast fell, only to be instantly replaced by another. We were retreating, forced deeper into the woods. My injured leg slowed me down, a searing trail of fire with each ragged step. The stranger shoved me onward, grunting with exertion. Can't. Keep! I gasped, vision blurring. I know, he bit out, a flicker of something almost like despair crossing his face. Keep going! We stumbled into a thicket of tangled overgrowth he must have scouted. He pushed me behind him, his axe flashing like a beacon in the moonlight. Don't move, he ordered, meeting the next charge head on. His furious roars echoed as mine and the creature's ragged breathing slowly faded. I slumped against a tree, the world swimming nauseously. He'd given me time, but how much? Then a howl, different than the rest, piercing, mournful, echoing with a bone-deep pain I somehow recognized, retreating footsteps. Then an eerie silence settled. I waited, heart pounding, shotgun raised but useless against whatever that was. Minutes stretched into an eternity before I dared call out, Hello? My voice sounded small, broken. He emerged from the undergrowth, streaked with blood that wasn't all his. His axe dangled from a limp hand, face gone slack. They're gone, he rasped, collapsing next to me. Dawn painted the sky gray as we limped back to my cabin. We never exchanged names, didn't speak much at all. There was a shared understanding, a bond forged in the heart of horror. He cleaned my wounds, his movements surprisingly gentle for a man who'd butchered those creatures without hesitation. Turns out, he lived in the Boundary Waters, too, further north. Had been tracking them for months, lost his wife and son to... to those things. The rest of that day is a blur of tending fires, making crude bandages, and the sickly sweet scent of antiseptic. The stranger slept in fitful bouts, muttering in a language I didn't recognize, twitching as if haunted by nightmares even worse than mine. I should have questioned him more, pushed for answers. But a chilling dread settled in my bones. Sometimes, ignorance is a mercy. As the days turned into an indistinguishable haze, we crafted a plan. It was insane, reckless, and possibly the only way to stay alive. Those creatures were territorial, intelligent. I was no longer isolated prey. I was a threat, and so was he. Our cabins, supplies, everything, they were lures now. We'd create another, far more tempting one. 
we stripped my cabin. Canned food, blankets, my few prized possessions, the books I'd reread till they were tattered. We piled it all on a makeshift raft we dragged three hard miles downriver. Then, we lay in wait. It came a week later, a flicker in the moonlight larger than any wolf or bear. The leader, drawn by the scent of provisions, its wounded side healed but leaving it with a disturbing limp. We had one shot. The raft sat in the middle of the water, flammable kindling laid out. The moment it stepped aboard, the explosion ripped through the night. Echoes rattled off the hillsides as the raft erupted in flames. I can't claim the creature died instantly. Its screeches were the most horrifying sounds I'd ever heard, a symphony of unimaginable agony. Silence fell just as abruptly, broken only by the crackle of fire. We watched till dawn, rifles clutched tight, but the rest of its kin never appeared. Was it the only one left? Were there more lurking just out of sight? We didn't, couldn't wait to find out. We left the Boundary Waters that morning. Never looked back. Drifted south, hitched rides, took odd jobs in small towns with populations too large for those things to risk hunting in. The stranger, Finn, he finally introduced himself, ended up in the rough desert of Arizona. I settled for the dense forests of the Pacific Northwest, far from where we'd survived, but never truly safe. The Boundary Waters remained a forbidden territory on unspoken maps. We carried the scars, the haunted eyes. No one believed our half-rambling tales, dismissed as wilderness-induced madness. We learned to carry it alone. We learned to keep moving. Years ticked by. I honed my survival skills, a constant battle against the ever-present dread. Sometimes I'd catch a flicker of movement in the dense undergrowth, and my heart would seize, the phantom echo of those growls making my skin crawl. Had they followed? Expanded their range? Was nowhere safe? News reached me in bits and pieces. A mangled hiker in the Appalachians, a slew of missing persons in Canada's remote territories. Reports bore chilling similarities to what I'd witnessed, but were never connected, dismissed as animal attacks and tragic accidents. Yet I knew the truth. The creatures, whatever they are, remain out there. Multiplying, perhaps. Or worse, evolving. They hide on the fringes, picking off the unwary, the ones who, like me, dared to venture too far into the wild. I carry this chilling knowledge like a curse, I write this now from a dingy motel room on the edge of a sprawling city. There's a duffel bag packed, an old shotgun under the bed, and a part of me that never fully unpacks. The city offers the illusion of safety, anonymity. But I hear them sometimes, in the echoing screech of tires, in the predatory eyes of strangers on the streets. They're still out there biding their time, and the world sleeps oblivious. My name is Lincoln and I may be one of the last who knows the true face of the wilderness. Some monsters aren't just stories. The sun was just beginning to set as I entered the dense, silent forest near Pine Ridge, a small Native American reservation in South Dakota. My name is Akacheta Asagua, and I am an amateur investigator with a thirst for exploring unexplained mysteries. Strolling deeper into the woods, I came across a small gathering of people with dazed expressions. Their faces were smeared with dirt, their clothes torn as if they had escaped some unspeakable danger. I approached them cautiously, asking if they needed assistance. They exchanged brief glances before one of them spoke up. We've been searching for our missing friend for days, the man said. We found something else instead. It's been hunting us. As we ventured further into the woods together, they explained how bodies had been turning up in the area over recent weeks, mutilated beyond recognition. 
Each set of remains had been discovered at different points in time, leading them to believe that whatever was behind this was not a human serial killer, but some sort of creature that stalked its prey unrelentingly. We stumbled upon a cabin deep within the forest, where faint screams echoed from within. Hesitating for a moment, we decided to investigate as a group. Creeping forward and peering through the front window, we spotted an immense, animalistic creature devouring leftovers from what seemed like a recent kill. Its massive jaw gnashed on flesh and bone with powerful force. The monstrosity had deeply matted fur covering its body and limbs that ended in razor-sharp claws. Upon closer inspection, we could see patches of scales interlaced with the fur, giving it an almost serpentine appearance. The sheer size and grotesque features made it clear that this creature was unlike anything any of us had ever encountered or heard of. My blood ran cold as the creature raised its head and locked eyes with me through the window. In that instant, we knew that it was aware of our presence and intended to hunt us down one by one. Panicked, we fled the cabin, each of us scattering in different directions. As I sprinted away from the cabin, I could hear the guttural growls of the creature following close behind. While running through the forest, I tripped over a tree root and slammed to the ground. Too fatigued to get up, I decided to crawl underneath a nearby fallen tree trunk to hide momentarily. I struggled to catch my breath as the scent of decay from the trunk almost suffocated me. As I lay there under the rotting wood, shadows began to move overhead. The creature was getting closer. In terror, I remembered stories from my father about a shape-shifting being he had encountered long ago in another part of the reservation. It stalked and killed people for sport, but disappeared when confronted by a group of warriors wielding sacred weapons. As the shadows above me swirled and changed into a swarm of crows that circled my hiding spot, I understood that whatever this monster was, its legend had been passed down from generation to generation without understanding or recognition amongst my people. The nameless creature was relentless in its pursuit, taking different victims every time while remaining hidden within our folklore. I couldn't summon help. No one would believe me if we somehow managed to escape this ordeal alive. But all hope wasn't lost. That fateful encounter my father had might provide some hint as to how we could survive against such an adversary. Suddenly, I heard my companions outside being picked off one at a time, their cries resonating through the quiet air before silence descended once more. Quietly emerging from my hiding spot, I knew what had to be done before this creature claimed any more lives. I crawled out of my hiding spot, carefully avoiding the swarm of crows that still circled above. My heart pounded as I tried to remember the encounter my father had described to me. He had mentioned a group of warriors wielding sacred weapons who managed to chase off the creature. If only I could find something similar, we might stand a chance. In a desperate search for anything that could help, I spotted a hatchet leaning against a tree stump nearby. The handle was etched with symbols that seemed familiar, like the ones from my father's story. Without hesitation, I grabbed it and held it tightly in my grip. It might not be much, but it was something. I turned and saw the creature approaching, an immense wolf-like beast with matted grayish-black fur covering its muscular body. Its eyes were a sinister blood red that bore into my soul as it sneered at me through curved fangs stained with blood. I could see in its gaze that it intended to make me its next victim. I wanted to scream and call for help, but there was no one left to call out to. The creature had made sure of that. As the snarling beast lunged at me, I swung the hatchet down with as much force as I could muster. The blade connected with its shoulder, sending it reeling backward and letting out an agonized howl. To my astonishment, it seemed like the hatchet was causing the monster considerable pain. It began inching back towards me, its eyes now filled with fear and uncertainty. Maybe this weapon from the stories really did have an effect on this being. The creature focused its attention back on me, as if deciding whether or not to continue its pursuit. It growled lowly before slowly backing away, all while maintaining direct eye contact. 
it was clear that without more answers or knowledge about what this creature could truly be defeated by, I wasn't going to be able to finish the job. As I watched it slink back into the shadows, I suddenly became aware of voices calling my name in the distance. They sounded like familiar friends who might have escaped the creature's grasp earlier. Feeling a sense of relief, knowing others had survived, I quickly hid the hatchet in my waistband and began limping towards the sound, staying vigilant for any signs of the creature returning. It felt like an eternity before I reached my remaining companions. They were bruised, bleeding, and terrified. But they were alive. We didn't know what we were dealing with or how to truly conquer it, but we knew we needed to find help outside of our reservation. Leaving behind our dead comrades, we made our way to the nearest town to find authorities who might listen to our tale. We had hoped they would have another notion of what could defeat this beast or at least offer some guidance. Unfortunately, despite their best efforts to understand what we had faced, all they had was skepticism and disbelief. No one seemed willing nor able to assist us. We left soon after and vowed not only to find answers but also make sure that this story would not be buried with those who perished. This unknown creature shall not remain hidden within folklore anymore. It had taken too many lives under its veil of mystery. We owed that much to our fallen peers, Jake, Sarah, and Thompson, whose names and sacrifices would be remembered. With that determination burning inside us, as a unified group, we began searching for knowledge about this monstrous being and weapons that may drive it away once and for all. Hoping that our battle against this evil wouldn't end like it did for generations before us. But until then, this creature would remain a lurking reminder of just how terrifying the unknown can truly be. And from now on, whenever crows circled overhead, or shadows turned sinister under a seemingly ordinary day, we'd always remember and know that the concealed horrors within our legends still walked among us. This happened to me about two years ago, before I started working at a law firm in Savannah, Georgia. My name's Benjamin Eldridge, but people call me Benji. I'd enrolled in a camping trip with some acquaintances from my former job, hoping to make friends since I was new to the area. To avoid tourist spots, we decided to venture into Pine Barrens, a vast forest reserve on the East Coast. It was a sunny day when we gathered at the trailhead, our backpacks full of gear and high spirits overflowing. We'd been walking for hours when we stumbled on an old shack with words carved into the door panel. Leave or die. The sight sent shivers down my spine, and some of us chuckled nervously. Despite some feeling uneasy, our group leader, Clarissa Fairchild, reassured us that it was probably a prank. Further into the forest, we were hit by an overpowering stench that made my stomach churn. As we walked closer to the source of the smell, we discovered a gutted deer hanging from a tree branch, intestines dripping down like bullwhips. Most of our group hesitated. Some wanted to leave while others argued that it smelled worse than it looked. Quit freaking out, scoffed Emery Sullivan as he fingered his pocket knife. It's just an animal carcass. But I couldn't shake off the feeling that something sinister was lurking in those trees. Night fell, and it was around nine o'clock when Edwin Dracos had finished setting up camp, including roaring fire and space for our tents. We cooked dinner over the flames, but laughter around the campfire came to a halt after Emery remembered his missing camera from earlier in the day. I've got to find it, he insisted stubbornly. Reluctantly, Frederick Clark suggested hiking back and looking for it together with Emery. So they went off with their flashlights, while the rest of us remained at camp, not keen to venture further into the forest after nightfall. Time went by and the crackling fire became the only noise in an otherwise silent night. I was dozing off when a blood-curdling scream pierced the air, jolting me to my feet. One torch shone through the trees, illuminating Emery stumbling towards us as Frederick's scream echoed through the air. Help! Panic raced through our group. 
Clarissa quickly tried to call for help, but realized we had no cell service. We held our breath, waiting for Frederick or any sound. Emery gasped, his face pale. There's... there's something out there. It got Frederick. A sinking feeling made my hands tremble as we huddled together around the dying fire, knowing that we might be next. Then it happened. I saw them. First one silhouette in the tree line carrying a gnarled wooden club bigger than any of us. Then another emerging nearby gripping a crude spear. Men, or things that resembled men, stalked towards us with deliberate steps as we stared in shock. Run! screamed Clarissa at last. Petrified but determined to live, I sprinted aimlessly into Pine Barren's darkened depths behind the others, desperately longing for safety and silently praying for escape from something far worse than an urban legend. The grim race for survival continued as monstrous shapes tore after us through thorny bushes, closing in on my every exhale and inching closer with every step. I couldn't believe what I was seeing, cannibalistic mountain men approaching us with murderous intent. The situation seemed hopeless, but my survival instinct kicked in and I raced after Clarissa, Emery, and the others into the darkness of Pine Barrens. We ran blindly, hoping to put as much distance between us and our pursuers as possible. Branches slapped at our faces and thorns tore at our clothes. With each passing minute, I felt exhaustion creeping in. But the sounds of those horrific mountain men grew ever closer. As we continued our desperate flight, I racked my brain for any ideas on how to escape. Our lack of cell service had made it impossible to call for help. With every gasping breath and pounding heartbeat, I wished for some way to contact the outside world. Our group moved together through the darkness, driven by adrenaline and fear. But despite our best efforts, one by one, we began losing touch with one another. Clarissa's screams pierced the air as she was caught by one of our attackers, her fate sealed. I pushed through the pain in my legs and lungs as I stumbled upon a hiding place, a fallen tree with a hollowed-out trunk large enough to curl up inside. Without thinking twice, I squeezed myself in there and held my breath as best I could. Time stretched out infinitely as I hid inside that tree trunk, heart pounding in my ears, listening for any signs of our pursuers. At one point, their heavy footsteps drew dangerously close, yet they seemed unable to find me within the dark confines of my sanctuary. Eventually, dawn began to break. Despite my fear that leaving the tree might mean running right into the arms of a waiting mountain man, I knew it was also a chance to get help. The sunlight filtered through the trees as I silently crept from my hiding place. The woods were eerily quiet now that all the chaos had died down, and I hoped that meant our attackers had left the area. Not wanting to take chances, I climbed a nearby tree to get a better view of my surroundings before moving on. From up high, I spotted a nearby road winding through the forest. With renewed determination, I carefully climbed down and made my way towards it. As I walked along the road, I flagged down a passing car, desperately hoping that the driver would be willing to help. As luck would have it, the man behind the wheel was a local police officer who believed my terror-filled account without hesitation. Grateful for his intervention, I guided him back to where our terrifying ordeal had begun. We discovered the remains of Clarissa and Frederick in a grisly scene. Their bodies had been brutally mutilated, carved up like animals by those sickening mountain men. Although horrified by the sight, I knew deep down that sharing their fate would have been mine if not for my narrow escape. The officer called for backup, and a full-scale investigation was launched into this unthinkable incident. The authorities tracked down the remaining members of our group. Those who had survived found solace in one another as we pieced together what had happened. Together, we learned just how close we'd come to becoming the prey in these brutal mountain men's twisted hunting game. Shaken by all that had transpired, we mourned the loss of Clarissa and Frederick, horrified by their gruesome deaths at hands of these sadistic predators. Although we were able to help lead law enforcement to uncover and arrest some of these cannibalistic mountain men hiding deep within Pine Barrens, 
not all were caught. It's likely that many will never face justice for their heinous crimes. As I look back on that harrowing night, I'm thankful for having escaped alongside some of my friends, though heartbroken at those we lost along the way. The terror-filled events that took place in Pine Barrens will forever haunt our memories, serving as a chilling reminder of how quickly a fun adventure can turn deadly. The lookout tower perched on the jagged spine of the Appalachians was the epitome of isolation, a fitting post for someone like me, Garrett Hollis, looking to trade the noise of a disintegrating marriage for the solitude of Virginia's endless green. My job was simple. Watch for smoke, report fires. On paper, it was an escape. In practice, it became my purgatory. I shared radio frequencies with other lookouts, but seldom spoke, save for check-in routines. The only company I had was a delivery drop once a month by a quiet man named Hoke, whose eyes always seemed burdened with unvoiced stories. Then came the wilted Thursday morning when the radio hissed news that rendered my heart hollow. A hiker had gone missing on one of the popular nearby trails. I scanned adjacent ridgelines through binoculars seeking signs. Hours warped into days with search parties trekking up from town, their fluorescent vests dotting the thick foliage below like land-bound stars against an emerald sky. On the third day, that's when I saw something, or thought I did, fleeting incoherence between two pines at dusk. The shape had four limbs and wore no bright vest. It was as if the forest itself had walked out of its depths briefly before returning to its roots. Breaks in this routine were uncommon. This deviation clawed at my curiosity enough to pry me from my eerie on my day off under the guise of hiking and engaging in the search. Harvey from Supply had talked about coyotes growing emboldened, but what I glimpsed wasn't a coyote. It bore no snout or fossy-filled eyes. The bent underbrush and muddied prints suggested something heavy had traversed toward Bear Meadow, an area where teenagers discarded empty cans and scratchy curses into late-night bonfires. My trek to follow these anomalies grew confused as evening pressed down thickly upon me phone reception flickering in and out like a failing heart monitor. I saw you at mile seven, breached suddenly from my radio. A message not intended for me yet received all the same. That number, something skittered within me. It matched where those prints led. Pinned by instinct in Bear Meadow's cold clearing with night advancing, I held motionless beneath a tree strung with broken bottles like glass wind chimes. The silence cradled an unsettling weight until it erupted into chaos. A distant outcry cleaved abruptly short so severe that my skin recoiled before thought could catch sensation. My approach toward that terrible boundary of silence might have been madness or folly, but every bone screamed it was necessary. As I neared mile seven under a crescent moon that offered scant mercy, light splattered across collected rain near an overturned backpack the same branded pack the missing hiker was reported wearing. No screams tonight, no thundering footsteps or bear bellows. The sane world would expect an animal dragged her away, a bear or hungry mountain lion, but round prints don't fit round pegs. What padded across soft earth, leaving behind traces of an oversized man with no discernible toe lines? Whatever shared this vast woods hadn't claimed any name from folklore or cryptozoology forums. It simply existed here, living a narrative parallel to known biology, yet intersecting tragically with ours. I turned and sprinted, certain only of the need to get away. Behind me, branches cracked under heavy steps that pursued with relentless intent. I dared a glance back and caught sight of an imposing figure, large, with limbs that seemed too long, ending in hands that were more like claws. It wore no clothes, and its skin was a mottled dark gray. Its eyes reflected the moonlight with an unnatural gleam. My breath rasped in the cold air as I pushed through underbrush, stumbling over rocks hidden in the night's grip. 
I thought of my phone, but fear cemented the thought that no signal would penetrate this wilderness in time to save me. The creature let out a sound, a guttural howl that did not belong on this earth. It was close. I came upon a ranger's station, abandoned for the night, but the door gave way when I threw my body against it. I slammed it shut, wedged a desk against it, and sank below a window as silence engulfed the space. A scream echoed from mile seven, another hiker caught unawares. It was Jane Richardson. I remembered her face from the missing posters. There was no attack on me, just waiting, a vile prey to a hunter unseen but deeply felt. Morning light crept timidly into the room. I emerged to the remains of chaos, tracks around the cabin and a final scream hanging heavy in the air. I reported what I saw but stayed silent about impossible creatures, leaving such thoughts unspoken yet hauntingly considered as officials combed Bear Meadow. A rescue team found Jane's brother clutching her backpack. She was gone without a trace save for those unsettling tracks. Closure eluded us all as only whispered questions remained. In homes, at memorials for those lost to something that evaded explanation or capture within dense forests growing darker with each passing tale of Bear Meadow's maw. This happened to me a couple of years back. Not so sure about exact dates. That part's all a bit of a blur now. You see, I like to rough it. Always have. Even before hitting retirement, weekends involved packing up the old RV and taking off. Wife hated it. Can't stand being outdoors for five minutes. But who needs her nagging, right? My name's Jasper, by the way. This particular time, I had the urge to explore Sequoia National Park in California. If you haven't seen it, those giant trees. Incredible. Anyway, as per usual, got bored quick of campgrounds and noisy tourists. Took the RV off-road, following one of those dirt tracks on the park map. The goal was some sweet, isolated forest to set up camp. Found the spot after a few hours. Tiny little patch of clearing beside the trail, tucked away nicely behind a thick batch of trees. The ground wasn't perfect for it, but the isolation was worth it. Now I'm used to roughing it. That's the whole appeal. Still, that first night there didn't sit right. Too quiet, if that makes sense. No crickets, no owls, not even the rustle of critters in the undergrowth. The woods just felt... dead. Tried to relax, cooked up some beans on the tiny stove, flipped through a magazine before turning in early. Then it started. It sounded like footsteps at first, heavy stomps out in the darkness. Figured it was a bear, something big enough to knock the RV around. Then I heard this other noise, almost like wheezing, rasping breaths. Not any animal I ever heard before. Now, I had my pistol on me, loaded. Not that it would take down a grizzly, but hey, enough to scare most wildlife away. The thing was, it sounded close, real close. I couldn't help but peek out the RV window. Nothing in the moonlight. Every shadow moved, though. Or was it just my imagination? my old brain playing tricks. I didn't go full-on scared until those footsteps circled the RV. Something walked all the way around, slow and deliberate, like it was checking me out. After that, couldn't sleep. Sunrise felt like a year coming. As soon as it was light enough, I broke camp and hauled ass back to the main road. I was halfway out of the park before I thought to check the rearview mirror. For once, it was better not to look. I saw handprints on the back of the RV. Massive, dirty prints too big to be human. Five stubby fingers on each hand, and what looked like claw marks gouging the metal under the dust. Tried telling myself some teenagers made them, some dumb park prank. Deep down, knew that wasn't possible. Thing is, that wasn't the end of it. A bit later, down the road, I pulled off at a rest stop to use the facilities. That's when I saw the news alert pop up on my phone. Missing hiker up in Sequoia. Found his abandoned campsite, right near where I was the previous night. No sign of the guy, just his gear all shredded to hell. 
Report mentioned his SUV covered in those same prints I saw. Never went back to that part of the park. Don't talk about what happened much neither, except for this one time. People wouldn't believe it anyway. Would you go back if some freak stalked you all night? If he could have smashed through the RV walls any time he wanted and dragged you off kicking and screaming? Yeah, didn't think so. Here's the weirdest part. The guy on the news wasn't the only one who went missing around then. Over the next few months, there were whispers about other vanishings around Sequoia, backcountry campers mostly. No trace, no evidence. I knew, though. Knew damn well that thing, whatever it was, was behind it all. Look, maybe all it really wanted was to scare me off. Maybe that's its territory or something. Hell, maybe it wasn't even the same thing attacking those folks. But after that night, the isolation I always craved just tasted like danger. It wasn't about the wilderness anymore. I realized a truth some never learn. There's stuff out there in the dark that shouldn't exist. You don't go looking for it. And damn sure, it shouldn't find you. A few years back... Feels like it could be yesterday or some twisted lifetime ago. You want to hear a story that sticks with you? Let me tell you, that ain't always fun. My name's Kai. Back then I worked construction, long hours, good money, left you too beat to think much. My one escape, getting out into the wilderness. Not fancy parkland with trails and tourists either. I loved places forgotten, places that seemed like nature didn't want you there. A buddy of mine, Deshaun, felt the same. This trip, we'd heard rumors of old copper mines up in northern Minnesota. Not that we expected to find much, more the excuse to camp remote, explore off-grid. Took that battered Land Rover he babied up narrow logging roads, way, way off the map. Got to a point where even that couldn't hack it, and we hiked the rest. Miles of dense undergrowth, old forest with trees thicker than a man, that kind of place. Phone reception died quick, but what did we care? It was all freedom and wild air. Second day in, we stumbled onto it. No big structure, just a deep depression where the land had collapsed, all choked with brush. And in the wall, you could see it. Veins of green showing a seam of copper ran beneath. I laughed remembering the stories old-timers had told of lost fortunes in these hills. Deshaun, always more practical, started examining the site. He reckoned that depression meant tunnels beneath probably collapsed and unsafe. Not a big deal. We weren't there to get rich. He started poking around, trying to figure where the original entrance would have been. Here's what messed with my memory later. There was a stink there, kind of musty and iron-heavy, like dried blood in an old building. We hadn't seen a damn bit of animal life that entire hike. No deer tracks, no squirrels, even birdsong muted. That struck me weird, but you figure animals aren't stupid. Maybe predator scent was hanging heavy or whatever. I shrugged it off. Should have paid more attention to that gut feeling. We set up camp well clear of the mine, Deshaun taking an odd interest in those collapsed pits. I got the fire going. We had a nice supply of freeze-dried stuff, even a couple beers packed in cold. Sat near the flames, listening to the forest settle down for the night. Then I heard Deshaun yell. Not scared, more surprised. I was on my feet, snatching up a flashlight. No gun, never crossed my mind to need one out here. My light barely cut through the dense trees, only picking up Deshaun's outline as he scrambled from thick brambles back toward the clearing. There's something! I saw! He sputtered, shaking. He wasn't a spook type. That finally kicked fear into me. What you see, man? My voice tight. Behind him I caught it. Flicker of movement on the tree line and eyes. God, those eyes. Wrong colored. Way too bright and way too big for the dark shape below them. The flashlight shook in my hand. The thing hunkered down, 
long skinny form moving impossibly fast through the tangle of brush. A dog or coyote maybe, my brain desperately filling in the gaps. Then it roared. Too deep, too rough for anything like that. It seemed to tear something apart, and in a heartbeat, there was Deshaun screaming, swearing, then a wet choking sound as the scream cut off. I dropped the flashlight, turned tail and bolted. Blind panic had me. All I could hear was my own breath, ragged and loud. No sounds behind me, but no Deshaun anymore either. Only that damn roaring echo. The dark and twisted trees reached out to grab at me, but somehow my feet knew the way back to camp. I tripped and stumbled, ripped up my hands and legs, didn't care. It was instinct. Move, hide, survive. I tore down the tent, kicked dirt over the fire, threw everything into the Land Rover with shaking hands. I wasn't thinking, just doing. That was what saved me. Because at the last second as the engine rumbled to life, I caught a flash of yellow behind the driver's seat. I whipped around, the light inside weak, empty. My skin started to prickle, and something stank in there. That sharp, metallic smell. Not blood. Something else. I never went back for Deshaun's gear. Just floored the gas pedal, tearing out through the undergrowth in a way that surely wrecked the suspension. No idea if it followed. Just knew I wasn't waiting to find out. Busted out onto the dirt road hours later, hands still cramping around the wheel. Had the sense to slow down then, pretend this was a normal drive home. Saw sunrise streak the sky, and swore to myself it was all in my head. Only cops in town found something. Remains a ways down the road, half eaten. The medical examiner struggling to even identify the species. Claws, maybe, they said. Not any predator common to the area. And on my seat, where I swore I saw those eyes, they swore up and down there was no trace of blood, no animal hair. I filed a missing persons report for Deshaun, played dumb with the authorities, left vague hints at wild animal territory. They laughed it off. It's my burden now, that no one would ever believe what we saw. Left that construction job. Can't stand those confined spaces now. Got enough saved up to live simple off the grid for a while. Sometimes, if I look outside late at night, up at the clear sky and endless pines, I think I see a glimmer of yellow somewhere among the stars. That's when I hear that roar again, and swear that the musty stink is back on the wind. And yeah, maybe some old stories talk about them. Skinwalkers, they call them. Maybe I never want to hear that word again. Maybe I still don't believe. But there's nights when all that freedom of being out there alone ain't quite so appealing anymore. This happened to me on February 18th, 2003. Folks thought I was crazy moving into a cabin on the edge of the Okafinoki Swamp. Hell, sometimes I thought I was crazy too. But I'd had it with city life, with the rat race and the noise and the nosy neighbors. Figured me and the gators could find a way to coexist. Besides, rent was cheap. Name's Everett. First few months were fine. Learned to fish and trap got used to the damp and the buzz of a quadrillion mosquitoes. The gators mostly minded their own business, and the tourists rarely strayed too far from the established trails. Sometimes felt a prickle at the back of my neck, like I was being watched, but I shrugged it off. Told myself it was just swamp fever messing with my head. Then one night, about six months in, I woke to the sound of scratching on the cabin wall. Sounded like claws. Now I'd heard plenty of critters around the place at night. Possums, raccoons, even the occasional curious bear cub. But this was different, heavier, felt purposeful. Grabbed my flashlight, crept over to the window and pulled back the curtain. Moonlight shone on a pair of eyes staring back at me, glowing red. They were bigger than any gators, set in a head that was... wrong. Like something squeezed and stretched sideways. Before I could get a good look, 
the thing melted back into the shadows. Next morning, I went looking for tracks. Didn't find much clear. The swamp floor is a mess of mud and roots. But there were marks, bigger than any animal I'd ever seen. The scratching on the cabin looked more ominous in the daylight. Tried to tell myself it was my imagination or some local messing with me. But down deep I knew that wasn't right. Whatever was out there, it wasn't human. Started keeping a shotgun loaded by the bed and a machete within reach. Slept with one eye open. Nights were the worst. I'd lie there listening to every rustle in the sawgrass, every croak from the heart of the swamp. Seemed like whatever it was, it liked to circle the cabin, just beyond the reach of the porch light. Sometimes I'd catch it peering in the windows, that misshapen head and those red eyes. It was toying with me, I realized, wearing me down. After a week of this, I couldn't take it anymore. Packed my essentials, loaded up my old John boat. Figured I'd head to Waycross for a few nights, stay at a cheap motel, get back to hot showers and a ceiling that didn't drip. Let my nerves settle. As I pulled the boat through the murky channels, I felt eyes on me the whole time. Spent a restless night at the motel, my dreams filled with claws and dripping fangs. Woke up the next morning determined to head back. No way was I going to let some... some swamp monster drive me from my home. Maybe if I faced it head on, it'd back off. That was the plan, at least. Turns out, reality had a different idea. Late afternoon, heading back into the swamp, I heard it. The unmistakable sound of a gunshot echoing through the trees. Paddled faster, unease settling in my gut. A few minutes later, I rounded a bend and saw them. Two men, tourists by the look of them, up to their knees in the murky water. One was slumped on the muddy bank, blood seeping into the swamp. The other was screaming, firing wildly into the trees. Before I could react, the creature lunged from the undergrowth. I never got a good look, just a flash of dark, scaled hide and a massive, clawed hand. The man barely had time to turn before it was upon him, dragging him into the tangled mess of roots and branches. Heard the sound of bones snapping, then silence. I paddled like hell, not stopping till I reached my cabin. Barricaded the door, loaded every firearm I owned, and hunkered down to wait for nightfall. My hands shook as I poured a stiff drink, tried to tell myself it wouldn't come, that it was satisfied. But deep down I knew that wasn't true. Night fell, and it came. Claws rasped against the walls, that hideous, elongated head pressed against the windows, its red eyes burning through the darkness. I fired at it through the glass. Heard it roar in pain, but it didn't retreat. It kept coming, battering the walls, trying to force its way in. Around dawn, it finally gave up, leaving a trail of dark blood smeared across the porch. I spent the day patching up the damaged walls, trying not to imagine it just lurking out there, biding its time. Exhaustion finally overcame fear, and I drifted into a fitful sleep. Woke to the sound of voices. Confused at first, I stumbled to the door. Turns out a park ranger had been doing his rounds, heard the gunshots, and found the remains of those poor tourists. He didn't believe a word I told him about the creature, of course. Said it was probably a gator gone rogue. But there was fear in his eyes, no matter how he tried to hide it. He gave me a curt warning about staying alert and took off. He wasn't wrong about being alert. It started hunting me in earnest after that. I caught sight of it almost daily, watching from the swamp's edge. Things went missing from the porch. My fishing net sliced to ribbons. The axe left with its blade driven into a tree stump. Then the attack started again. It would come in the night, over and over. I fought it off with guns, with fire, with anything I could lay my hands on. Folks in Waycross started whispering crazy old hermit, lost his marbles, that sort of thing. One morning, found a notice from the county tacked to my door, something about unsafe dwelling and 
mentally unfit. Figured it was only a matter of time before they'd come with nets and a padded van. That's when I decided enough was enough. I wasn't going to hide in my cabin anymore or wait for them to cart me off. If it wanted me, it would have to come get me. I spent two days making preparations. Sharpened knives, crafted spears, reinforced my old John boat as best I could, stocked it with food, supplies, and every weapon I owned. Come sunrise on the third day, I was ready. I took one last look at the cabin, the only real home I'd known in years, and then headed out into the heart of the swamp, figured the creature was territorial. If I pushed deep enough into its domain, I could force a confrontation. At least that was the hope. Paddling through the narrow channels, I felt its eyes on me the whole time. The air thrummed with tension, like the moment just before a lightning strike. Each rustle of leaves had me gripping my rifle, heart pounding in my chest. By late afternoon, I'd reached a patch of the swamp I'd never explored before. The water turned black and still, the cypress trees thick as prison bars. The smell of rot and decay hung in the air. This was it. I knew. The creature's lair. Beached the boat on a muddy bank. Before I could get my bearings, shadows moved in the undergrowth. I heard a low hiss, then another, and another. And then they emerged, not one creature, but four of them. They were even more grotesque up close. Their hide was mottled, dark green and brown, thick as armor. Their limbs were too long, too thin, ending in those massive claws. The heads, that was the worst. Narrow and elongated, with jaws lined with rows of needle-sharp teeth. And those eyes, burning red in the dim swamp light. One of the creatures lunged, and I dodged on instinct, firing my rifle more out of panic than aim. It let out a piercing screech as the bullet grazed its hide. The others attacked in a frenzy. They were fast, impossibly fast, swarming my tiny boat. I swung the rifle like a club, smashing one across its snout. It stumbled back, hissing in rage, grabbed a spear, and stabbed at another that was clawing at the side of the boat. The tip pierced its scaled flesh, and it howled. But for every one I fended off, another seemed to take its place. One of them snagged me with its claws, raking across my thigh, screamed in pain as I was thrown against the side of the boat. Vision swam as I struggled to my feet. My leg was hot with pain, blood already soaking through my jeans. It was no use. They had me surrounded. I was dead meat. Somehow, in my struggle, I dropped my rifle. It was in the murky water, out of reach. No time to even think of getting it back. A creature lunged for my throat. I desperately threw up my arm to block it. Heard a sickening crack. Felt the teeth rip through flesh and muscle. The world spun, and I slammed into the muddy bank. One of the creatures was over me, its rank breath hot on my face. I was done. Too hurt to fight anymore. The creature opened its jaws, drool dripping from its fangs, closed my eyes, waited for the end. And then it came, a roar echoing through the swamp, deeper, more powerful than any of the creature's screeches. The creature above me froze. It whipped its head around, looking for the source of the sound, a flicker of movement, then a massive shape plowed through the undergrowth and slammed into the gathered creatures. If I thought what came before was big, this was something else. Taller, broader, a true monster. Its hide was covered in ugly scars, and one eye was milky and blind. The other eye, it burned with the same eerie red glow as all the others. It ripped into the creatures with a fury that was terrifying to behold. Claws the size of butcher knives disemboweled one, snapping its spine. Its massive jaws closed around the throat of another, crushing it like a tin can. A whirlwind of rage and violence. The smaller creatures scattered in panic, screeching in fear. The big one turned its gaze on me. For a moment I thought I was next, but it just looked at me, a strange flicker in its red eye. 
then it turned and disappeared back into the swamp as quickly as it came, leaving a trail of carnage in its wake. Lay on the muddy bank, gasping in pain. Blood ran freely from the wounds on my arm and leg. Somehow, I was alive. In the distance, I heard the terrified screeches of the fleeing creatures echoing through the trees. It took me hours to crawl back to my boat, to patch myself up as best I could. Used a broken branch to splint my mangled arm. Dusk was falling by the time I drifted back downstream, guided more by instinct than good sense. I stumbled onto the shore near my cabin late that night and collapsed in a heap. Didn't know how, didn't know why, but I'd survived. Next morning I awoke to the sounds of trucks and shouting. Rangers, deputies, reporters, the whole nine yards. The news of the dead tourists. They'd finally pieced together enough to realize something wasn't right out in the Okafinoki. They found me, of course. Took one look at my wounds and bundled me into an ambulance. Delirious with pain and blood loss, I babbled about monsters and red eyes. They just patted my hand and muttered about swamp fever and shock. Spent a month in the hospital. County had a hearing while I was laid up. Declared me a danger to myself. Sold the cabin for pennies on the dollar to some real estate developer. Tossed me into a state-run group home, the kind they stick the old and forgotten in. Tried to explain it all to them, to the doctors and social workers. They smiled those condescending smiles, nodded politely, and upped my medication dosage. Don't yell at them anymore. Don't throw my meds across the room in frustration. Learned it's better to be the crazy old coot who rambles about swamp monsters than the angry, bitter one who just reminds everyone he's lost everything. Sometimes, late at night when I can't sleep, I stare out the window at the manicured lawn of this place and the streetlights casting long shadows and I think I see a different set of shadows, shifting in the darkness beyond. Sometimes I hear a scratching at the window and a muffled hiss, and I catch a whiff of something foul and rotten on the night air, and sometimes I think I see a flicker of red, just for a second, glowing out from the shadows, watching, waiting. The swamp's a lot further away than it used to be. It doesn't matter. I know it's out there. Something was amiss. That much I knew when I woke up. My name is Tala Windtalker, and I live on the Shoshone Native American Reservation in Wyoming. The sky was gray, the air was thick with tension, and the silence pervaded through our modest settlement. As I went about my chores and greeted my neighbors, Luda Redcloud and Ayesha Crowfeather, I noticed the eerie quietness persisted around us. A small group started to gather in front of Luda's house, exchanging whispers. What's happening? I inquired. Ayesha swallowed hard before speaking. Mita Hasina was out for her morning walk and found Wikikini Grapple Road's front door left wide open. No one knows where she or her family are. We all stood shocked. It wasn't like Wikikini to be so absent-minded. What could have come over her? An unspoken fear simmered beneath our collective thoughts. Determined to uncover what had happened, we decided to form a search party. Equipped with flashlights and gear, we marched towards the woods at the northern edge of the reservation. As our search gained momentum following worn trails that snaked around tall, ancient trees, a stench erupted from a thicket nearby. There on the ground laid a gory spectacle. My neighbor Wikikini mauled beyond recognition. Thin wisps of hair were all that remained of her gentle face. We called for backup over the radios while pain stabbed into our hearts, but something far worse awaited us in those woods a creature surely no human had ever seen before. It struck without warning, powerful claws ripping through Niol Tsisqua as he cried out for help. Standing twelve feet tall with an elongated snout filled with razor-sharp teeth, it seemed primal and otherworldly in a way no Hollywood costume designer could replicate. Our search party spread even thinner. We needed to warn the others, 
but I couldn't abandon my search for Wikikini's family. Gradually, the world around me shrank as the thrill of the hunt took over. As night morphed into twisted shadows, a narrow trail led us back to the main road. Our small group was relieved to see flashing lights approaching. The backup had arrived. Solid ground beneath our feet again, Luda and Ayasha strategized. We couldn't wait for this creature to strike someone else. We had to be proactive. Together we are stronger, Ayasha insisted, her voice hoarse from swallowing her emotions. We need to track this thing and put an end to it once and for all. So that's what we did. Grabbing whatever weapons and gear we could muster, we stalked through the woods like warriors from our ancestors' legend. Despite our troubled determination, reality kept creeping in. Nayol's last scream echoing in our ears, Wikikini's unrecognizable form haunting our thoughts. Time bled together as we pursued this monstrous beast through a labyrinth of twisted branches and gnarled roots, occasionally catching a fleeting glimpse of its shaggy flank or claw prints uprooting the damp earth. I felt as though we were both predator and prey. As the sun dropped below the horizon, plunging us into twilight masquerading as darkness, we heard huffed, breathing off in the distance, guttural yet rhythmic. Before I even processed the thought, my instinct screamed at me. This thing knows we are here. We moved cautiously, our senses on high alert. Ayesha suddenly whispered to Luta and me to stop. She pointed at claw marks on a nearby tree trunk, signaling that the creature had been here recently. We knew we had to call for help, but were worried about the potential danger to anyone who would join us. We should call the police, I suggested quietly. They might know how to deal with this kind of situation. Ayasha shook her head. They'll come in force. They won't be stealthy like us. We don't want a full-blown confrontation with this thing. I could tell she was right, so we decided not to call for help, but instead relied on ourselves and our bond of unity. In the fading light, I observed Luta gripping his weapon tightly while scanning the tree line for any sign of the creature. His face wore a grim determination born out of necessity. We understood that it was him or us. We followed the trail of claw marks as they grew more frequent and distinct, until finally we realized we were approaching the creature's lair, a small cave hidden between dense foliage. The throaty breathing we heard earlier grew louder as we neared. Luda held up his hand for us to stop. Whatever happens, he whispered, we need to stick together and act as one unit. Thus began our final confrontation with the monstrous beast that killed Neol and Wikikini. Ayasha moved around the side of the cave entrance while Luda and I took positions on either side. In three, Luda counted down under his breath. Gripping our weapons tightly, we sprang into action on Luda's synchronized countdown. As soon as we rounded into the entrance of the lair, our eyes beheld an abomination beyond belief. A nightmarish melding of animal and undeniably humanoid features. The creature lunged at us, baring its grotesque elongated teeth and emitting an ear-piercing screech. Luda swung his weapon, connecting with a sickening thud against one of the creature's robust legs. I struck next, aiming for its malformed head. The creature howled in pain and fury as it thrashed against our combined attack. In the madness of that brutal melee, the monster's claws carved wide gashes into Luda's arms. It swung around to strike me but collided instead with Ayasha, who had maneuvered to flank it. With all of our combined might, we finally subdued the monstrous being and watched as it took its last, shuddering breaths. Terminator-like silence enveloped the cave. Heavily wounded and fatigued, we stood together over the fallen beast. In those moments before leaving its lair forever, I realized this terrible thing may have been some twisted form of bear corrupted by forces beyond our comprehension. In the days that followed, authorities descended upon the cave to investigate the creature. With no precedent in natural science, they could only speculate about its origin while they sealed off the area for further study. Our unity in facing such an abhorrent challenge remains unyielding, 
a bond forged through shared turmoil and tragedy imprinted upon our souls like carved stone. We keep Neol and Wikikini in our hearts daily, remembering their wisdom and kindness with every sun that rises and sets. And though we'll never know why or how fate unknowingly sent us on a path to fight against such a horrifying antagonist, ultimately it strengthened us, reminding us that life is precious, fleeting, and must be fiercely protected. And so we live our lives not solely for ourselves, but also for those who were tragically taken too soon by an all-consuming darkness unbidden into our world. Sworn to uphold their honor and ensure that their sacrifices will not be forgotten. This happened to me three summers ago when I decided to visit Appalachia for a hiking trip. I was looking forward to escaping city life for a while. Tired of being cooped up in my apartment, I booked a cabin in a small town called Pine Ridge near a trail that promised beautiful views and challenging terrain. I'm Jack Preston, a bank employee from Delaware who needed this break. During the day, I'd take long hikes, and at night, I'd unwind by campfires and conversations with the locals at the town bar, people like Jim Foster, a cheerful truck driver, and Emily Watkins, a kind-hearted waitress. They made the place feel like home, it was about the fourth day into my trip when I stumbled upon something gruesome. While hiking down a less traveled trail, I discovered a human arm half buried under some rocks. The sight almost made me sick. Panicking, but trying to keep calm, I decided against yelling for help because I didn't want to attract any unwanted attention. Instead, I headed back to Pine Ridge to inform Sheriff Melinda Mitchell of my horrifying discovery. Offering her assistance in investigating further, we returned to the scene together. Little did I know that it would set off a chain of events that would lead me into the depths of pure terror. As Melinda and I picked our way back to where I found the severed arm, we noticed signs of other disturbances. Broken branches and trampled bushes that hinted at violent struggles. Throughout this day-long investigation, we felt increasingly uneasy, as though watched by an unseen observer. Evening snuck in as we searched for more clues, or even an abandoned campsite belonging to whoever had done this horrific act. Feeling drained from the day's events, we decided to turn back when we heard an ominous crack echoing through the darkness. We froze. Our hearts pounded as fear crawled up our spines. Seconds later, a blood-curdling scream pierced the air, followed by distant footsteps swiftly approaching us. We instinctively ran. Dodging trees and navigating the rocky terrain, we spotted a makeshift shack down in the valley. Thinking it might be a safe refuge, we rushed inside. The dimly lit space reeked of decay, fresh bloodstains covering the floor and walls. This was no safe haven. It was their lair. Emerging from the shadows, a group of thin, disheveled men surrounded us, almost indistinguishable one to another. Their smiles were cold. Hunger appeared in their eyes as they stared at us like predators about to pounce on their prey. These mountain men were cannibals, feasting on whatever unlucky travelers who stumbled into their territory. They had remained anonymous and evaded capture by living in seclusion, hiding under everyone's radar in Pine Ridge. In that horrific moment, I knew better than to call for help. Our screams would only entice them further. We had bumbled straight into the lion's den. Sheriff Melinda and I exchanged panicked glances, too terrified even to consider our options for fear of losing precious seconds. It had been such a beautiful morning when I first set off on my hike. And now, here we were. Trapped in this nightmare scenario with no idea how we ended up here, or if we could ever escape. As the cannibals closed around us like a tightening noose, my mind raced backward from this dark spiral into our descent from paradise just a few hours ago, before everything started down this path. Melinda's voice shook with fear as she said, Jack, I think I see a way out. I followed Melinda's gaze 
and saw a small opening in the wall that, had it not been for the thin beam of sunlight penetrating it, might have remained hidden forever. Without waiting another second, we darted towards the opening, hands scraping against the rough stones covering it up. As we squeezed ourselves through the narrow passage, I could hear low guttural growls echoing from behind us. The cannibals were not going to let their next meal slip away that easily. The passage seemed endless, and as we scrambled over rocks and twisted roots in a blind panic, I couldn't help but wonder if it would lead us to an even more horrifying fate. Finally, after what felt like hours of navigating the seemingly never-ending tunnel, a tiny glimmer of light up ahead offered hope. Bursting out into open air and sunshine was such a relief that I nearly collapsed out of sheer gratitude. But there was no time to rest. We had to keep moving, because as I glanced over my shoulder, I saw those vile creatures emerging from the darkness like bloodthirsty ghouls. They're still after us! I yelled over my shoulder to Melinda as we ran down Pine Ridge towards civilization. We need to find a phone or someone who can help. No sooner had I spoken those words than a pickup truck came into view up ahead. A man in his fifties, clad in worn jeans and flannel shirts, stepped out of the truck, surveying his surroundings for any signs of danger. Help! Melinda yelled between breaths. Please, you've got to help us. There are cannibals chasing us. The man looked skeptical at first but took one look at our blood-stained clothes and panicked expressions before ushering us into his truck without hesitation. I think there's a police station just down this road, he said as he slammed on the accelerator pedal. I glanced back through the rear window, fretting over the creatures that had been pursuing us. We arrived at the police station haphazardly, spilling out of the truck and rushing inside while our newfound ally parked his vehicle. Inside, we relayed what had happened, hands shaking and voices quivering as we recounted our tale of horror escaping Pine Ridge. The officers listened attentively, but I could see doubt in their eyes. Who could blame them? Our story was something straight out of a nightmare. Regardless, a search party eventually was sent out with us in tow to trace our steps back to the cannibal's lair. With rifles loaded and flashlights scanning the darkness, this time accompanied by a slew of armed professionals. We ventured deep into Pine Ridge once more. We found the underground chamber eerily empty, or at least it seemed so until we discovered several hidden passages sprawling like spider webs beneath Pine Ridge. The perfect escape route for those damnable cannibals, who must have heard sirens approaching and managed to scurry away like rats in the night. In that horrifying lair, we found evidence supporting our claims stacked high, bones picked clean of flesh, belongings stripped from their deceased owners and trinkets taken as souvenirs. Melinda and I managed to survive our traumatizing encounter with those ravenous mountain men. The police kept an eye out for any suspicious activity up in Pine Ridge, in hopes that one day they'd be able to capture these monsters responsible for so much suffering. All this changed Melinda. The once shining sheriff became uneasy on patrol at night, forever haunted by those cold, ravenous eyes looming just beyond sight. Me? I locked away all memories of that cursed hike and took solace in knowing that no matter how difficult life became from that day forth, at least it would always be better than what fate had planned for me back on Pine Ridge with those cannibalistic creatures. The brutal murders ceased but the fear of those lost souls who may have suffered horrendous deaths still lingers in our hearts. Pine Ridge will never be the same for any of us in this tight-knit community, and we mourn. To this day, we remember each of those who were taken from us, innocent victims of a monstrous appetite born in the shadows of twisted folklore. This happened to me a few years back. Honestly, I'm still not totally over it, but a friend, Derek, suggested writing everything out might help me cope. Camping has always been a favorite pastime of mine, and maybe sharing this might stop another unsuspecting person from becoming a victim like I almost was. Let me introduce myself. I'm Lionel. 
Most people think camping is something you do when money is tight, but with work getting more stressful, a few days in the woods has proven to be the ideal way to disconnect. My buddy Derek feels pretty similar about it. In our early 30s and single, we've got time on our hands for short getaways. My preference swings towards remote locations, and the beauty of an RV is it offers comforts even deep in the wild. This trip, we ended up on a strip of land in the Daniel Boone National Forest in Kentucky. If you've ever been, you know it can be fairly dense with limited road access. Cell reception tends to be shoddy, but that's part of the allure. That Friday, with all our supplies loaded, we made the four-hour journey. We pulled into a rough trail at dusk, a little hidden nook I'd heard about that seemed perfectly remote. That first night, everything felt normal. Cold beers, a cracking fire, stories told till late. Then, morning rolled around, and that's when things changed. Waking up, something on the RV roof caught my attention. Derek was still snoozing. It sounded heavy, like a shifting weight. We'd heard branches fall or maybe the occasional animal scramble up top. Nothing new. Except this was different. The scraping went on, with a strange rhythmic pattern to it. I started feeling uneasy. I poked my head through the hatch. What I saw, well, it sent chills through me. There were deep furrows scored across the metal roof, now, a bear attack wasn't impossible, but this damage looked deliberate, the cuts oddly sharp. Suddenly, an ungodly screech filled the air. I swear it sounded human, but twisted and high-pitched. That got Derek stirred. He stumbled out, half in his sleeping bag, with a sleepy, The hell was that? I pointed towards the noise, but whatever made it was already gone. Derek chalked it up to animal antics, even tried cracking a joke. His nervous streak showed through the laughter, though. The uneasy feeling persisted in me. It felt too quiet. I thought I heard rustling around the perimeter. The woods themselves seemed to have... stilled. Then, the strangest thing happened. I stumbled across a pair of pliers resting at the base of a huge oak, clean and rust-free. They weren't from our kit. Something was truly off here. Derek didn't share my suspicion. He's always been the more level-headed one. However, we agreed it wouldn't hurt to get the hell out of there. Just as I went to pull up the anchor, something slammed into the back of the RV. It jolted us both violently. I spun around in time to catch a flash of movement, a human form disappearing into the trees. In that split second, my stomach lurched, this wasn't an animal. It had long, matted hair, filthy clothes hanging in tatters. This thing, this person, they seemed just as feral as wild creatures. Without a word, I slammed the rig into gear, leaving a cloud of dust as we peeled off. I could see glimpses in the mirrors before a turn in the trail obscured our pursuer. Heart still pounding, Derek asked what the hell that was. Frankly, I had no idea. Man? Beast? I hadn't the slightest clue. In the rear view, as the forest began to shrink, I swore I saw something watching us from the woods. But by then, maybe my terror was playing tricks on my mind. At a gas station down the road, we both got out, surveyed the RV for damage. There were more of those scrapes, some deep gouges around the back entrance. Derek went pale. Maybe he was beginning to think I wasn't crazy. The police couldn't do much. Those forests are vast, no evidence beyond the damage in our shaken states. It felt wrong to go home just like that, and part of me still longed for the wilderness. In a show of bravado, we ended up heading out to a state park, more established, more people about. I wanted to put it all behind me, and we almost did. Until that final night, it had been fairly uneventful. But in the pre-dawn, I got this gut feeling something was wrong again. It was that oppressive silence, a heavy stillness pressing on me. I crept to the camper window, straining to see into the shadows. Then it came, 
that horrible shrieking from earlier, like a knife cutting through the forest. Derek jolted awake, and in a silent flash of understanding, we just ran. Keys, wallets, shoes. Who gave a damn at that point? I jumped behind the wheel. Derek hopped in, and I put that pedal to the floor. Just then, an inhuman shape leaped through the darkness, slamming into the camper hard enough to dent the body with a thud. But we managed to get out. Tires spun, spitting gravel behind us as we plunged recklessly down the gravel road, back into the lights and safety of civilization. That was the last trip Derek took with me. Honestly, who could blame the guy? We've drifted apart in recent years, the experience probably too dark to shake. It's only now I am putting this on paper, and even still, it sends shivers down my spine. I haven't gone back into the woods since. Maybe someday I will try again, but I always wonder, was it some person living on the edge of insanity out there? A deranged hermit? Or maybe was it something... else? I'll never know. And frankly, I'm not sure I want to. It happened a few summers back, but when people ask when exactly, I mostly shrug. Time melts out there. They mean calendar time, anyway. For me, there's before and after. My name's Jake, or was Jake. That was matters. That before bit. Ordinary guy, office job, girlfriend whining about my workaholic tendencies. Turns out, getting dumped while on vacation ain't so bad. Gives a man time to clear his head. So, that summer, just me and the road. My trusty old jeep, few supplies, and an itch to head toward the southwest. No plan, just drift. I drifted right off the interstate outside Moab, Utah. It wasn't even an exit, just a dirt ribbon cutting off toward the horizon, and this sign someone nailed to a warped wooden post, Canyonland Ranch, Accommodations. Well, why not? A night in a real bed for a change sounded pretty tempting. It's probably five miles until the place comes into view. Long line of low adobe buildings. Not your fancy ranch more like something they dug up out of the 1800s. Place hums, though. Generators churning. Horses tethered in a corral. Smoke from a cooking fire that smells less like BBQ. More like something gamey and wild. My stomach rumbles, a mix of road hunger and unease. Nobody greets me. Door stands open on a long room. Oil lamps flickering on rough-hewn tables. Voices spill out. Laughter, but that raspy kind, something hard under the surface. I call out, maybe asking about a room, but that only brings out this old crone of a woman. Gray hair pulled into a knotted bun, stares right through me like glass. Not your place, she mumbles, then just points with a bony finger back the way I came. Turns out that finger means business. Before I can argue, Another woman, bigger, stronger than she should be, steps out of the shadows, blocks the doorway. A silent shove, hard enough to bruise a shoulder, sends me back the way I came. Now, here's where I should cut my losses, gun that jeep back toward civilization. But I got this stubborn streak, and that gamey smell sticks with me, sparking hunger deeper than road food satisfies. It's dark by the time I circle back, sneaking closer on foot this time. They got one room tucked behind the others, all lit up through cracks in the window shutters. Inside, a feast laid out. Not burgers and beer, but hunks of raw meat, some still dripping. No forks, just those six or seven of them huddled around, tearing with their hands. And the faces, not quite right, proportions a bit off, teeth way too sharp. But it's those eyes that hit hard, yellow, slitted, a kind of gleam I see in my headlights when a coyote darts out at night. Fear hits like an electric shock then, but some idiot instinct keeps my feet rooted to the dirt. Should have listened to that fear, that's the lesson here. Should have bolted. Instead I watch, see what those things 
do. The biggest one must be six and a half feet if he stood straight, gets an old bone in his grip, then just starts gnawing at it like a ravenous dog, not eating exactly, more like gnawing at the shape of it. I remember something my grandpa told me back when I was barely old enough to tie my shoes, something about how things imprint themselves on bones. That idea turns around in my head, sticks hard. Those aren't leftovers they're chewing on, and they aren't eating. They're trying to get at something else. There's that rustling coming from outside the window, like leaves scraping against dry dirt getting closer. Only there's no wind, and something whimpers. High, pitiful sound cuts through me. No way could those... Those eaters out there have made that cry. Then it dawns on me. That smell didn't just draw me in. It drew something else in, too. Suddenly, this thing barrels into sight, slamming against the flimsy wooden walls. Must be some scrawny deer, way off course, panicked. My eyes follow it while it darts across the clearing, straight toward the back, where the horses are corralled. That same wrong sense of proportions, legs too long, head too small. But as that starved deer shape hits the open space, what leaps out after it ain't natural. Something big as a bear, but loping, not bounding. Pale gray skin stretched tight over two sharp edges, and those same damn yellow eyes. Those things in the room, they ain't the top of the food chain out here. The real predator just made its appearance. Noise cuts through the night, screams, but both animal and something worse. That thing tears open the corral and its chaos. Horseflesh explodes in clouds of dust, shrieks echo way off the canyon walls. Then, there's the howl. And I know it ain't even that creature's full fury noise. Just amusement, maybe. Same way a cat plays with a mouse. Common sense finally slaps me upside the head. I turn, sprint back toward where I left the jeep, every rustle in the scrub making me jump. Something lopes right in front of me, cuts between me and escape. Looks almost human for a split second before dissolving, shifting under the moon into pure white fur, wolf the size of a horse, staring right at me with glowing yellow eyes. Those other hungry, gnawing shadows are circling closer too. It's that old woman's voice raspy behind me. Told you this ain't your place. Then something hits my legs from behind, and I tumble down hard into the dirt. That wolf thing has its muzzle practically in my face, sniffs at my neck like I'm the next dish on its menu. They don't kill me. Not straight out, anyway. Drag me back to their feast room, prop me up like a broken-legged scarecrow. Then, just eat. Watch me with their glowing eyes while they gnaw on those old bones and I start to wonder what exactly gnaws at me. That thing outside keeps making that satisfied purring growl sound while the rest pick at their gruesome prize. Morning is coming when they let me go, or chase me off. Doesn't matter which. The first rays of daylight turn that beast from wolf to mist, then nothing. Those remaining huddle under their rough overhang, watching as I stagger past. Something tells me they don't need to hunt with that much left over on their plates. But they aren't watching me for that. More. Anticipation. Like there's something about me now. The taste they left inside me. A kind of rotten hunger they know will gnaw through my good sense faster than it gnaws through my flesh. It's their last look, their silent taunt, that makes the running start. It takes maybe an hour before I stumble across the road flag down some poor tourist family in an overloaded RV. They're screaming, of course, when they get a good look at my blood-smeared face and ripped-up clothes. They drive me to the nearest town, the nearest phone to call it in. Sheriff takes one look at me, doesn't ask much, tells me I better go see the doc before filing any reports. Something in his face says he ain't doubting my story just doubting there's words anyone in his little town wants to hear. Doc stitches me up, writes shock on his clipboard, maybe tosses in a bit of concussion for good measure. I stay on at the cheap motel room in town, 
can't face that open highway yet. It calls to me, but at night, at night, it sounds like something howling behind my door. That gnaw. It ain't hunger for food. I figured that out fast. It's this itch under the skin. The want to see one of those ranch windows lit up by fire. Another feast under those yellow eyes. There's the other craving, too. One I hate worst. To prowl in that pale, wolfish skin. Feel that raw power coursing. To leave this broken jake shape behind. There's a word the locals whisper after a few beers. Word they say under their breath to explain those folks out beyond town limits. Gone missing every so often. Skinwalkers. Maybe it's a myth. Maybe it's truth as old as these red rocks. That don't change what's twisting inside me. I ain't Jake anymore. That guy died out at that ranch with the deer and the hungry horses. The thing squatting here in his old skin is more hunted than hunter now. The real fight now is against what clawed its way up inside me. Problem is, I ain't got much skin left in that fight. Every day they get stronger, those whispers from those yellow eyes. The taste I carry from that raw bone isn't fading. Sooner or later, I'll end up right back where I started. A broken scarecrow propped up to watch one more gruesome feast. People start noticing, of course. Not about me, really. About the ones that drift through town and just vanish. Some are those adventurous types, hitchhikers who think desert's friendly just because the postcards make it look pretty. Now and then, it's someone local gets that lost look in their eye, just walks west until they don't walk back. Locals always point them toward that Canyonland Ranch sign. Smile that grim smile of folks who know something none of us want to talk about. Those are the ones I envy most. I'm never getting free of it now. Never getting back to a world small enough not to hear those voices under the wind. Nights, I wander those empty streets, listening. Maybe those things circle. Maybe they know their prize wasn't ready to claim yet. There's that itching urge to look beyond the boarded-up shops peek in dusty windows. Something might peek back. There's a wrongness to those shadows pooling on the cracked sidewalks, like they hide shapes with too many legs, eyes brighter than broken glass. The howls have gone silent. Only thing left now is the waiting. For them to decide the feast is finally ready. For me to decide when it's too late to fight the pull. This ain't much of a life more like a slow dying. But you asked for an ending, a tragic one. That's mine. There's only one question left hanging, one I ain't got the guts to answer yet. When I break, when I join that hunt, what part of me stays just human enough to know exactly what I've become? That's the real horror, losing, but knowing in the last second just why you lost. 